Welcome to the Echo Oscar Delta podcast, where we talk to Navy EOD techs and hear the stories that they want to share. All ideas, thoughts, and statements are those of the guest and the host of Echo Oscar Delta, and not of Navy EOD or Navy as a whole. Today we have Carl Cron on. He did 19 years, got out as a senior chief, deployed six times, two as a, uh, as a fleet sailor, four as EOD, uh, went to the Med, the North Sea, Iraq, Philippines, Afghanistan, and then uh, one of the good ones, the SIF, SIF round. That's right. Um, appreciate you coming on. No, super cool. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's absolutely. Excellent. Absolutely, man. Um, you know, I, I like I like kind of starting from the beginning, right? And when we did the, uh, the questionnaire, it worked out great because you put on Eagle Scout Carl. That's right. That's so, right. I was a good boy at one point. Yeah. <laughs> Just well, half my life, I think. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's start there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, in high school, I was a total nerd. Nice. You know, I was, I was, you know, I was watching Star Wars every weekend Excellent. with my friends. You know, we played Dungeons and Dragons. Awesome. We'd go camping. We'd set up, a, I, I became an Eagle Scout um, after, gosh, it took me at least six years as a boy. I was a uh, uh, joined in fifth grade. And I'd moved, so my mother, it was just me and my mom growing up. Okay. And she moved to a new town. And friends in school were Boy Scouts, so the friends that I made. So I started doing Boy Scouts. And I ended up sticking with that and never played sports. Didn't try out for any sports teams in high school. Really? Just, yeah, we just, you know, hiking and camping and learning actually a lot of survival skills. And a big milestone for us was like, you get Order of the Arrow, which they actually do like a survival training for oh, the yeah? weekend. To become Order of the Arrow, that was a big deal. You get elected in by your, by your troop. Nice. Um, you know, doing troop leadership. And so every week we'd meet and we'd have either different activities or we'd prepare for camping, like meal preparation, vacuum sealing our meals, um, you know, planning our routes, nice. you know, making sure we had the right maps and we'd, you know, practice compass navigation yeah. and plan our routes and then, you know, kind of execute those missions. And it was very paramilitary. Yeah. You know, and, it was, and I had a good troop. And you, there's a lot of unfortunate news like the Catholic Church with Boy Scouts. Yeah. Right. And, now that they're scouting and they're they're branching out and they're doing more and i've actually volunteered when i was living in washington i would volunteer and help it where i could with my friends that were part of the um the organization the overarching organization that would help organize troops yeah basically just making sure all the paperwork was turned in and everybody was you know kind of paying their dues and, and doing all the right things but nice so something we stayed involved in but those friends um are still some of my best friends that's awesome. You know, most of them are engineers now. So they, really? all, they all went like a smarter path. <laughs> I joined the Navy. Um, yeah, I was 17 when I graduated high school. Okay. And then I uh, had to wait to join the Navy. So I, yeah. I worked all summer. I took an apprenticeship as an electrician. And then um, I was 18. Uh, so August. And then I signed, signed up in September of 97. Yeah. For delayed entry. And I, I knew, Lisa, I, I, I did have some foresight where I knew boot camp was in Illinois and I didn't want to do boot camp in the winter. Yeah, so smart. So I waited, so I did six month delayed entry and left in March. But nice. March of 98 is when I, when I, you know, processed through MEPS and got on that flight to Chicago and nice. found my way to Great Lakes and yeah, Great Lakes and then uh, ET school. Okay. And originally when I went through MEPS, so back in, going back to September, I took you know, they test you, you take your, your ASVAB tests. Yeah. And I did good enough ASVAB. Like, Hey, we have this nuclear power school program. And they said, uh, you just have to take this math test. It was like a calculus test. And I didn't, um, didn't do so well in the test. They came yeah. in they're like, well, yeah. So you finish your test and what else do you want to do? <laughs> it's like whatever else has a bonus to it. You know? Yeah. Right. Cause I joined the Navy back then. I just, I just wanted to travel. Okay. The whole point was, you know, I had family who had ridden ships Yeah. You know, uncle was in the Navy during Vietnam. Another uncle was Army, and my father was Air Force. So they had those three kind of covered. My brother was a Marine. He was in the first Gulf War, and he gets out in 95. Yeah. And he told me, stay the fuck away from the Marines. Really? Yeah. He's like, get a real job, join the Navy. There's no need to do the Marine Corps stuff right now. And, of course, you know, that whole shift changed in the 2000s, obviously. But, yeah. But, yeah, in the, in the 90s, it was uh, Bill Clinton, you know, reducing the Navy type, yeah. of, type of situation right. back then, you know. So it was, it was just all about getting on a ship and traveling, and I did that. That's awesome. Did pretty well, two two tours over in Europe before, before the Euro. Yeah. You know, before nine eleven, I was on my second shipboard deployment when nine eleven hit. We were actually in Plymouth, England. Yeah. I was nursing a hangover with a <laughs> Snickers bar and a Diet Coke, <laughs> and it was like, yeah, eleven thirty. We were three hours ahead, and the news came. 
And all they said over the one MC was prepare the ship for sea. America's under attack. No kidding. That's it. Like I'm literally like inside of a ship, you know, no TV, no radio, no idea what's going on in the world. Jeez. Just, you know, just being my normal self. And, uh, yeah, that, that statement, like I just, you know, you put yourself in that position. Like I remember exactly where I was at in the hallway. Yeah. I could probably, if I really thought about it, I could probably think of the whole numbers of the, where I was standing when I heard that one MC announcement, but that was like everything dropped. Yeah. And you're like, man, I still got buddies out in town. You know, one of my friends was actually in Amsterdam. He took, he took a, like a Liberty weekend, uh -huh. put in, you have to put in the request to go outside the area for more than 24 hours. So it's kind of like a mini leave. Yeah. But he was in, he was in Amsterdam with another shipmate. And then they had to get back to London. And then the British military flew them by helicopter out. Well, we were already out at sea, really? but we got out to sea that day. That's crazy. And then he went down to Rota and loaded up. Didn't let us off the base in Rota. They were just loading up missiles. Yeah. Followed the Enterprise. And we were the one of the first ships to start launching Tomahawks into Afghanistan. That's got to be like just, when, you, when you say like prepare the ship for sea, the America's under attack. Like, Peacetime Navy, two, we used to call them booze cruises. Yeah. Because the whole point was like, yeah, you get the East Coast, you get to go to Europe. That's yeah. amazing. <laughs> you know? West Coast guys get to go to Asia, and that's a lot of fun, too. But, I mean, bouncing around the Mediterranean, there's no other experience like that. Yeah. It was really fun. Like, every weekend, we're in a different city in the Mediterranean. Yeah. That's, and then and that was all came down to crashing halt. That's crazy. Yeah. Like, literally, when you say that, like, I feel it, you know? And, like, that's got to be weird. Yeah. I mean, I, I was I was supposed to get out. Like, October 2001 would have been my, you know, close to my EOS, my yeah. first enlistment. You know? I was almost, you know? In the, and, of course, the opportunity was to re-enlist. You know, we were in the Adriatic, so I reenlisted tax free in October. Nice. And then um, I actually had like a really roundabout way of getting to EOD. Yeah. Because back then, you know, it was, you know, obviously we're at war. It was a mm -hmm. wartime Navy. And the only wartime or fighting force you can think of on the ships is the SEALs, because they're obviously the most famous. Yep. You know, I mean, Charlie Sheen was a Navy of SEAL, course. right? So <laughs> every, I remember growing up watching that movie. Charlie Sheen and Michael Bean as Navy SEALs and badasses, dude. <laughs> the know? most accurate Navy SEAL movie there I, is. I think so. I don't think anybody's ever come close since then. <laughs> but the, uh, so with that in mind, you know, that was what we did. We just trained, we trained really hard and a whole bunch of us like tried out. Yeah. Um, I ended up getting my shot to buds in 2002. Well, it was that winter. So 2003, by the time I got there, right after that January. And then, um, yeah, I, I didn't, I washed out, you know, yeah. I became what's known as a Bud's dud. Yeah. And there's quite a few and people don't understand that there's about 90% of people that go to Bud's end up duds. Exactly. You know? <laughs> I was there too. Oh, no shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I remember, I mean, I quit during lunch because nobody ate lunch with me. <laughs> I was so mad at my class because I was like, all my buddies had quit. I'm sitting at a table in the defect. We're still sitting in the defect. This is like the day before hell week. I'm like, yeah. I'm not going through hell with these motherfuckers when you eat lunch with me. <laughs> That's awesome. So I went up to my class. I was like, I think I'm done. And anyways, I worked in the ET shop. They sent me to SDV in Virginia. So okay. I got to go to some other cool schools, learn how to work on their submarines, their sealed delivery vehicles, which is a wet submersible. And the team they sent me to was in Virginia Beach. Um, so I got a couple more schools. I actually got up to Whidbey Island for electronics, 2M, which is micro miniature repair. Okay. And then out to Florida, to Panhandle, where they build the SDVs. Yeah. And then to Virginia Beach, to the unit. Cause, and then they're also, they gave me that chance because there was a good chance I would come back. Most guys come back to Buzz to graduate. Yeah. You know, most guys that graduate, it's our second time yeah. or more. Sometimes a third or fourth try. Yeah, right. <laughs> Some guys, they kind of, they stay in the lane, wait, you know, they heal and then they mm -hmm. come back to another class. And I just told them I was interested in that yet. So I was going to go do my 18 months and see if it was something for me. And while I was at SDV in Virginia beach, I saw some guys and they had uh, pins with dolphins in them. And we're rolling up in our small boats. Cause I would, I was a small, small boat coxswain okay. for SDV. So we, I would drive the boats where they do the training and it was really fun because they would attack ships like they would train to attack ships. And so we take them out to the harbor at night and then let them, you know, do their thing where they're diving on dragers and doing yeah. cool stuff and getting ready to, you know, sink some ships in ports, which is, I mean, nice. that'd be super cool to see that happen. Right. Anyway, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, um, you know, doing these training missions and coming back and seeing these guys with dolphins, I'm like who are these guys with dolphins? I'm like, oh, those are just the UD guys. They're just the idiots that play with explosives. <laughs> you know, <they're, laughs> seals don't like anybody but seals. You know what I mean? <laughs> So I actually was talking to him and, um, and then I saw a magazine article and it's just kind of weird. So I met these guys with dolphins. I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Like you guys train dolphins. Like it's right. crazy. And, uh, especially coming from a fleet, you don't hear about anything at EOD in the fleet. Right. Especially back then. Yeah. And, um, I just remember a mag, I got a, there was an all hands magazine and there's a jumping dolphin and the EOD guy. And then you read the article and they talk about robotics and they talk about all the cool technical stuff they use, you know, 
x-ray technology and a lot of um a lot of things that were interesting to me as an electronics technician yeah because i would i was basically building repairing anything that plugged into a wall required power or was used to communicate i did audio video systems on ships i, I redid when they remodeled the wardroom i was the guy that was in there rewiring up new sound systems nice whenever someone had like a broken walkman they drop it off in my office and i fix it for them yeah, you just you know? dated yourself by saying Walkman. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I still call my phone a camera phone. <laughs> like, me get my camera phone out. That's awesome. <laughs> my kids are like, what are you talking about, Dad? <laughs> Crazy uh, old man. I feel it. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, Walkman and then MP3 players. And I saw the the mini disc players. I don't know if you remember those. They used yeah. To have, like, people used to buy these little discs and put them inside a little disc player and wear yeah. it on their belt. It was hilarious. <laughs> all that's gone. It's all, it's all just in some junkyard now, right? <clears throat> But so that, that having that background with electronics really appealed to me. And, um, you know, dive school was obviously really hard. Uh, but, and well, I think the hardest thing was going to EOD school from a SEAL command. Yeah. Like putting in that package. And then these guys are like, oh, motherfuckers, going to EOD instead? <laughs> and they had me lead PT at SDV one time. And basically all the SEALs were like, yeah, yeah, go to EOD school, dude. You know? <laughs> <laughs> just talking crap. And, oh, just like, uh, I couldn't break them, obviously. Yeah. You know? And uh, it, was, it was fun, though. I mean, they, they really pour, poured into me, made sure I was ready. That's awesome. You know, make sure, physically made sure I was ready. They wouldn't let me slack on PT. They didn't let me miss workouts. Yeah. You know, they, once they knew, they, they were really supportive. That's and cool. And they just wanted guys that's to good. do. And that's the thing about that community is like, no matter what you're doing in that community, they want you to be the best at it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, they, they support you. Um, and, I, you know, that's what I, the NSW and then going to EOD and being at EOD Tech and EOD Commands, there's a little bit difference, but there's still, you know, even the guys that were support that would want to go do something special. Like, I remember guys going to like, want to be a SWIC. Yeah. From like Guam. And so we'd, we'd help them out as much as we could. Yep. You know, yeah, yeah. It's like you, you know that somebody felt like it's feeling like you felt when you wanted to do it. So you're like, all right, well, because we've all been there. Yeah, we've all we've all been that wannabe. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're a wannabe, what you need is like a little bit of positive guidance. Yeah, and a lot of accountability. Exactly. And you may not like the accountability. Yeah, but it's gonna help you out. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, that's a, and that's especially what I do now. Like I, people are like, why am I getting charged this? I'm like that's part of your accountability. Yeah. <laughs> 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 nice. We'll get into that later. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when you, so after you finished uh, EOD school, um, well, I guess it, even, even before then, did you know much about EOD when you were going through? And then second part to that, after you finished EOD school and you got to, to EOD command, did it match up with what you thought EOD was going to be? Yeah. I was lucky enough to go mud pup. So I did dive okay. prep mud pup at mobile unit two. Nice. Which out of the three locations between the turtles in Florida, the movie and three guys, and then the movie and two guys, there was a good track record for movie and two. And they tell us about it. We had a big group. They're like, you know, we send out the most graduates and it's because we do this this way. Nice. And just having fantastic mentors. Um, even, you know, the late great Paul Darga, he yep. was, he was, a uh, one of the mentors for the mud pups while Josh Harsh, who's, Oh my God, I just got to talk names. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, I think they're out. They'll yeah. be, they'll just keep it there. We'll keep it with those yeah. guys. But, um, yeah, they ran a really fantastic program and it was just, just hard as nails. Yeah. And, and the way they did it, um, really made that first day at dive school, not that stressful. Nice. You know, that first like hell day where you're yeah. PT test, everyone's tired. They've been traveling and it's like, get right into it. 4am yep. PT test. And we're going to PT until, until basically lunchtime. And then after lunch, we're going to go to the pool and see what you guys can do in the pool. Yeah. yeah. The first day was just a nightmare. Right. And then we were just like, Oh, this is like an average day. We'll be in two. This is great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that is, that is true. I remember, uh, PSI and Mobile at three. Um, and, uh, there's a couple of people that were just savages, um, that, oh, that yeah. like turn the screws on you. Oh yeah. Just uh, always, always doing something. Even if, even if you were doing nothing, they made sure that that nothing was something. And yeah, it made it same thing when I went, it's like, huh, this isn't bad. <laughs> it was fun. It just made it more fun. Yeah. Like I'm actually ready for this. I feel mm -hmm. good doing this. Like we're going to have a good time. Yep. And so you can actually enjoy the process instead of just like dreading it. Yeah. And just feeling like you're getting beat down and chewed up every day. Yeah, exactly. But you know, there was plenty of tight days, especially that pool week. I wasn't, I had no idea that was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was going to get rolled and like wrestled and they would write, they wrote stuff on our tanks. Like can't hurt me. Yeah. And it's like, Oh yeah. And they come down and just <laughs> shake the shit out of you. Just, I mean, we had that, we had, we made a pretty fantastic video because those windows in the pool and people would record us yeah. taking our pool hits. And so we had like a compilation of like, our class pool hits and some of them were super gnarly. That's awesome. Good. 
Yeah. Yeah. I always love watching the pool hits and just watching dudes get thrown left and right and up and down. And you just kind of shake it off and come up. You're like, are you done? Yeah. Are you done? Okay. I'm going to get my air back on. <laughs> yeah, Let me get this thing going. The best one that I saw, I don't, I don't think it was my, I'm sure it happened in my class, but it wasn't a video from my class, but uh instructor like comes down, you know how like there's a bunch of videos where they would come down and just kind of like hover above uh, buddy pairs mm. as you're just like cruising along the pool deck. And it's awesome. Cause you're like, dude, they have no idea what's about to hit them. And then you see him grab one and put like his knee on the other and just like fling them apart. And you're yeah. like, Oh yeah. They need, they need something to like push off of. Yeah. They get that, they get that force. Yeah. Oh, man. And you like think back. You're like, I remember that happened to me. <laughs> That's awesome. When you do the buddy does, you're not sure which one or just like who's going to get hit. Sometimes right. I tell you, sometimes they didn't, but you, yeah, you'd see the shadows in the pool and it's like, you get that little anxiety, like, like, oh, there's sharks in the water. Yeah. <laughs> sharks are in the water. They're coming. Yep. <laughs> Take that deep breath as soon as you can. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and just hope that as you're taking it, your regulator isn't getting ripped out. <laughs> oh, I remember, like, trying to bite it. Like, no, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you got to your mobile unit, um, did, so after you had e-school and everything. And there's so much after EOD school. Yeah. And like people have no idea. Like right. Eglin's just step one. Exactly. And They're, it really underwater feels like part two of EOD school. Yeah. You go through like the meet with all services. Yep. And then you get to watch like, you know, the, the army guys graduate and then you watch the air force guys graduate and the Marines. And then you're like, Oh, we still got three more months of this. Yeah, oh, exactly. Shit. Yeah. And then at least, at least after that, then you're in EOD tech, but get that badge. then you still have airborne and tech. And I think there's a couple other things and now. Attack training but, was hilarious. Yeah. We had some guys that could not retain weapons and I really? drop names. They know who they are if they're listening. Yeah. <laughs> but we had to like run around and be like, was it decal holster and retain and like sing a song as they're like doing laughs on the range because people couldn't freaking latch their freaking pistols. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> We're learning weapons. You know, some of this is the first time. Yeah. You know, yeah, that's true. That's I mean, especially like, like a fleet guy. I had, I had shot, you know, the Beretta nine millimeter mm -hmm. M9 shot the, the M14, the 7.62, right? The old wooden handled ones. Yep. And um, never touched an M4, never touched a, you know, an M16, never touched a, a SIG. Yeah. You know, but our service weapons were just different. We had shotguns, we had Mossberg shotguns. And yeah. That was like, if you're on pier, you'd have a, one guy have a shotgun, one guy had a pistol. Yeah. And there's a funny story in Norfolk that those pier watches one time got robbed. Like what? someone showed up and robbed them of their weapons. <laughs> Fleet sailors, dude, come on. You have the weapons. <laughs> What are you who's robbing? How does that happen? Someone got the drop on him, I guess. That's crazy. Oh, gee. I know. That's so nuts. I remember just hearing that story like, so we're just going to go out there with Nerf guns next or something? You can't, <laughs> yeah. We can't be trusted. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. But that was also after 9-11, we got back from that deployment and, you know, pure security became like a real thing. Yeah. Everybody became security. Like they sent me to security school and really? then I got put on a security team on the ship. So it was like special security team, searching vehicles, learning all that stuff. Yeah. You know, as like as a new watch station because they created so many more watch stations. Mm -hmm. And if you were in a six section duty before nine 11, you were in three. Yeah. So we all had three section duty after that. So you had duty twice a week. That sucks. Yeah, It was rough. <laughs> Most of you guys listening are like, I don't know what that means. Yeah, Duty, <laughs> means, duty means you're stuck for 24 hours on the ship. Yeah. Hopefully you have a wife that brings you some food yeah. or you just eat the D or you just eat the galley food, which is fine. Yeah. But if you're lucky, still get some little town food or whatever, but mm. And it's always nice. That's like the best relief. But yeah, you stand and watch us all night. Yeah. And then you've got to work the next day. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's so, funny because, yeah, it's 24 hour duty, but that doesn't mean you're, you're not normal. Going. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You just, you, it's just the next day is just a normal work day. You do turnover in the morning and then you still go to go do your eight hours or whatever, your yeah. maintenance logs and all your, all your shift work and all that stuff. And then you get to go home and a couple of days later, stand 24 hour duty again. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, right. <laughs> That's how they, that's what that's definitely gets people through dive school. If you've been in the fleet, you're like, yeah. Hey, do you want to do this? Or you go back to having duty all the time. Like, oh, fuck, I'm doing some push ups. That's, I'm getting through this. Yeah. Anytime I talk to somebody that that was in the fleet first, they're like, you know, when things are terrible, even oh, if they're like having an injury, they're the like, yeah, day, but I, EOD is better than like, a good day in the fleet. Breaking my ankle and running on that is better than going back to the fleet. So, oh, yeah. I will just continue. Because you're going to hang with people who like to run in EOD. You yeah. Know what I mean, like, I remember leading PT on a ship because I was just, not like a PT animal, but I just enjoyed the process. Like I enjoyed getting up and working out with people. Mm -hmm. I had thought that, you know, I always thought that physical fitness was super important. You yeah. know, just being in the military in general, doesn't matter what service or branch yeah. or job. It doesn't matter. You I need agree. To be fit. You need to be fit to fight to save your life and save someone else's in need. Right. And, um, I remember leading PT on the ship and these people call out from back. 
we don't want to be no motherfucking seals. I'm like, you don't have to be, but you should be in shape enough to pass your PRT. Yeah. <laughs> Keep your job. This is about job. This is about job survival for you people. Agreed. You know, that, that's something that I've always thought is you should never have to train to pass the PRT. You should just always be in shape that at any time somebody could be like, Hey, yeah. PRT's today. And you're and like, we would oh, do, all right. And we had to do the um, Mandos. They called them the Mandos mandatory workouts. But yeah. you know, those of us that would volunteer as command fitness leaders would lead those workouts for people. So I think that, you know, where my business is at now started very, very early in my career in the Navy. Yeah. That interest from back then. Just, just training and helping on. people and get your ass in shape because you're going to feel better. Yeah. And once you're in shape, like it changes your life. It does. You know, so many people, I have so many stories of, me of my members now that, oh, thank you for what you do. You've improved my life. Like all I did was set this up. You did all the work. Yeah. Yeah. Hold them, hold them accountable, but. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to pay extra if you don't show up. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Um, yeah. So you, you get to, uh, you get to your command and yeah, which command do you go to first? 11 in 11? Washington. Okay. And Whidbey Island, which yeah. was like a dream. I'm from Washington state. That's awesome. And out of it took, so I had been in the Navy eight years by the time I graduated EOD school. Yeah. So I got to spend two years and I, yeah, it's a funny story. I read my orders wrong. I thought it was five years based on the date. Cause it was like month year, but it's yeah. like reverse, you know, oh, yeah. And yep. it's like, oh, I got five years in Washington. And so I bought a house as soon as I got there. <laughs> and like a year and a half in, they're like, where do you want to go? I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, so I was actually in Iraq on the deployment. They're like, where do you want to go after this? I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm coming back to 11. You know, I'm still, I'm still there for a while, right? <laughs> but no, two years, two uh, years. But yeah, it was, it was a dream being stationed back home and being able to, uh, I would ride my motorcycle from Oak Harbor on Whidbey Island. If you don't know the Puget Sound, it's a lot of islands, but mm -hmm. Whidbey is like one of the bigger ones. Oak Harbor is where the, the mobile unit was at the northern end of the island. So a lot of people would drive across and like live in Mount Vernon or, you know, there's plenty of places to stay, but Oak Harbor is a very small town. It's a yeah. one road town. And, um, the EOD techs, we just ruled the streets. Like we would, you know, the most disposable income, yeah. the most <laughs> energetic people, the most, <laughs> the biggest personalities <laughs> in the world in a very small town. Yeah. And those 11 guys back then, that was a really special time. That was a really special place. Dude, I, I have, I have heard that and I, I am so jealous. Like. I wish that it was still up there. I would have come back to the, to the West coast if it was up there. I actually tried to go That's just to the short end up there. But yeah. And it's dollars and cents. Out. Like, you know, the buildings, yeah, the buildings were built in 1945 or whatever. And it's just, you know, they built them a whole new command here in San Diego. Cause then it was like back then it was that fleet allocation and yep. consolidation of forces and getting closer to the training units and reducing the cost of people training. But, you know, we had Fallon, Nevada. We had our own little army town, basically like a mini China Lake. Yeah. And that was so much fun. You could know, hook up with the shore debt, actually do some, do some real bomb picking. Yeah. Cause it's a, it was a live de a demo range there. You know, you get to, so you got to learn that real UXO shore debt work. You got to learn, uh, and you worked in a small team setting in the, in our own little army town with the R and T shack. And so it was a really tight knit group That's awesome. travel together, work together, live together. Um, and then we'd, we'd be, and after like you do something at Fallon, you, then you'd go down for team training mm -hmm. and 11 guys, we were always so tight that we would just, Team training was always a blast. That's cool. You know, we didn't go home to our, you know, people in training units that if they're stationed in San Diego, you yeah. go home. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't go home. We just didn't have a home. We were, you know, on He's, travel together, which made the team, I think any team that travels together and lives together and has to deal with like, you get too many bands for eight guys, figure mm -hmm. it out. Yep. You know, it makes you, it makes you a family. <laughs> and really it's only one cause it's, it's the chief's minivan yeah. and then everybody else's. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, uh, I will keeping true to names we had uh lost our minivan once we we're getting ready for team training this is my mobile 11 team and um my, my tour at 11 started out in the rnt shack okay um and then i was put on a platoon that was going to ride the nimitz yeah so i went through team training with one platoon getting ready for the nimitz and that was just just a stacked platoon really so they took um half of us they changed the mission set they gave them two charlie divers Okay. to help clear ships. And they took half of us and then put us on mobility teams. So then I double tapped. I went back to a, went to the mobility team, Detachment 17 at the time, and then went back through team training. So okay. I did team training twice in one year. Dang. A little bit of time on the Nimitz, you know, like did their their pre-float, you know, their month out. Yeah. Comp like, 2X, yeah, I think it exactly, is. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, when they're basically they're FEP for, for deployment, right? Yeah. So I went through Comp 2X with the Nimitz, and then once they were ready to deploy, then they changed the teams. They gave it, you know, they chopped us, put us back into ops, and then got us on a mobility team, went back to team training. So it was my second time in team training and our LPO loses the van. We lost the LPO, lost the van. We're trying to get ready to go to training in the morning. Like, where the hell is he? You know, obviously having fun at night. Um, 
had to get the maid to open his room and chief walks over and just standing over him. He's just snoring like nothing's happening. You know, <laughs> she's looking down to this dark room and we are literally like, if you should have seen a fit of us, it'd be like heads stacked on top, just like looking in the room, see what's going on. And you just see chief look at us and like, close the fucking door. And he's like this. And she's like, wow, just wakes him up with the hardest slap we've ever heard anybody get administered right to the face. Oh, dude. Snaps the LPL right up. <laughs> we were at the training at 10 minutes later. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. We were just staying at uh, some place right there in Point Lomay, too. Yeah. So really close, but that's awesome. Yeah, those vans, man. People get mad. Where's the van keys? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Oh, God. Yeah, I remember that so, so much. <laughs> and you're like, all right, well, I guess I'm walking where I'm going. Mm -hmm. Nobody's responding. That's the worst. It's like, but you know, now you got cell phones and everything right so you got the the team text thread right and mm -hmm. like hey who has the keys 10 minutes goes by and nobody responds you're like god dang back, it. back <laughs> then in 06 it was like i had a nokia yeah the bricks the most reliable phone i wish i still had it but yeah people weren't even texting back then i remember, I remember right i remember we were talking shit about texting like oh i'll just call it's so much easier to make a phone call mm -hmm. and i was like people don't do anything but text right <laughs> and even then it's like uh it's still selective communication you know yeah I'm, I'm one of those people i'm terrible like i I have the huge phone. Everybody's like, why do you have that? It looks weird when it's up to your ear. I'm like, I don't call very much. Like, right. I just text or really it's, it's or even voice text. Like just yeah. telling the phone with the text people. Yep. Tell tell my watch to text my wife. You know, it's like, what a crazy world we live in. I know. Like, like Dick Tracy watches <laughs> talking to people. Yep. It's amazing. For those that don't know Dick Tracy, look him up. <laughs> oh yeah. We're going to get really old in this. Like there'll be some references thrown out there. People are going to be like Googling this. Like, right. What did that old guy say? Yeah. It's crazy. Um, going to, so your first team, you went to Iraq. Yeah. Well, yeah. First deployment as EOD was okay. Iraq. Yep. How'd that, how'd that go? You know, that was something that you're just not ready for, but yeah. we flew into to Talil in the South. And then we transported up to, we were South of Baghdad, but we were in M and D C S so multinational division, central South. I'll try to do more acronym descriptions for the listeners. Yes. Right. But so, yeah, we're south of Baghdad, uh, Scania and Diwaniya. It's like two, two fobs. Okay. Scania was a truck stop. It was a gas station. Oh, really? It was a huge gas station. Yeah. Which got lots of rocket attacks. So we took indirect fire IDF like three times a week. Um, even in Toledo, like my first, our first night in Iraq, we, um, there was a rocket attack. And I'm like, oh. And my LPO is the second time. is like, welcome to Iraq, motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to hear that shit every day. Yeah. <laughs> So you, you see civilians like diving the ground and guys just keep walking They're like this too far away don't worry about it <laughs> so you know who's salty and who's not you know right I mean? but yeah it was um definitely eye-opening experience the first night um you know that first transport very seriously like we're keep your eye on the road yeah everybody's looking out for stuff everybody's watching everything all the time there's no napping in the back seat like i was planning on doing because i was had a rough rough entry yeah so yeah <laughs> To, to describe the rough entry, so I would say, you know, everyone kind of has a specialty in EOD. And since me being a, a just a superb fleet sailor, I would say my specialty was liberty. Yeah. You know, it was a time off. I was a time off specialist. <laughs> I knew where to find all the good times. I knew where to, I knew how to maximize liberty. That's an and important job. We, we were, uh, when we flew across, so we flew from Whidbey, uh, stopped in Charleston, picked up a team from six, flew with them to, uh, across to uh, Moron, Moron Air Base in Spain. <laughs> And uh, that was, I can't remember, that was, um, I'm forgetting the town in Spain that was close to, but they had a castle. It was a cool town. Nice. So we were out there. They said like, okay, we're, you know, on the tarmac at 7 a.m. 6.55, we're leaving town trying to get back to that tarmac. <laughs> so we're just rolling in heavy. Not that late, but it was like, yeah. we're rolling in heavy, you know, steaming all night. It's like, we're going to Iraq. It's the last chance to just get, yeah. just get tuned up. And we're all just like blasted and super tired and take that last three hour flight, not enough sleep. And. You know, next thing you know, you're in Toledo and shit's blown up. It's on. Like, I was like, oh my God, dude, I was just in Germany. <laughs> or not Germany. I was just in Spain enjoying myself. Yeah. Germany was on the way out. And that's a whole nother, whole nother shebang. But yeah. I've, I've heard lots of stories about Germany and, and the rest stops. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. When you're on your way out, it's like the first chance you had beer in six months. Yeah. If you weren't creative and you know, it was. <laughs> I've also heard those stories. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's a brew kits are a thing. Yeah. yeah can happen and uh and i've heard you know because the u.s not allowed but not every country is like that so no not everybody's dry not yeah. everybody's stuff yeah general order number one no fun yeah <laughs> no booze no sex right <laughs> okay 
What about order number two? Where are we at? <laughs> yeah, it was uh, pretty, yeah, pretty strictly followed, honestly, because you had to be on call. Like, yeah. we, didn't, we didn't really fuck around. We had missions every night, um, almost every night. But it was like a, it was like it was a really predictable battle rhythm. You know, you're a mob team, right? So yeah, mob team in Scania, uh, supporting three seven three Cav Scouts. Okay. So cavalry scouts, army Cav Scouts, and then they had ODAs that were doing special operations and direct action missions. And so the team in Diwania would sometimes help with direct action. Okay. And the team in Scania was supporting Cav Scouts that were on observation posts, and then they were our QRF. Gotcha. They, they would have they had four stations where they would. You know, Cavs got through there on base defense, VDOC. They were doing observation posts or OPs, go out and, and wait and watch. Or they're doing QRF, or they're basically running services. So the services guys were usually always the same ones, but then the other three would rotate. And every time they rotate, we would do kind of country breeze for them and make sure that they were understand the IED threat. Yeah. And that's where the first instructions that I gave as an EOD tech were. So I'm a basic tech, but I'm an E6. Yeah. I've been in the Navy for a while. So I promoted in the training unit. Or at, in the um, R and T as a basic tech before I even got on a team, I got promoted to E six. Yeah. The first test I took as an EOD tech with the pin, I got E six. That's awesome. And I'd taken that test a bunch of times as an ET, never got it. <laughs> You're like, yes. But like, my average score, like my score compared to like ETs that got promoted, I yeah. was like so below everything because it, you know, it's just it was a hard rate to promote in. Yeah. But once you once you check that box, special ops, that's it. That's Can you awesome. spell your name? Here's your here's your crow. <laughs> that's legit. <laughs> That's right, because you when you first started, you still had to take your rate test mm -hmm. in it, EOD. It wasn't until what two thousand seven ish when it became a rate. Yeah. yeah, it was after it was after Iraq, maybe like eight or nine when it finally became an official. That's right. Yeah, official rate with its own rating test. Yep. And by then, I was done taking tests. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Work the system. I know. <laughs> Just slid under that like Indiana Jones. Another <laughs> reference for you kids. Right. <laughs> um. One of the things you wrote down on there was, uh, I'll just say, cause I, I'm interested to hear the other part of the story, but, uh, the biggest cash removal. Yeah. That's awesome. That's a, that's, um, so back to indirect fire, we took indirect fire like three or four times a week mm. until mid January. So about the first four months we were, you know, just kind of dealing with rocket attacks on a regular basis, especially having a juicy target, like thousands upon thousands of gallons of fuel. Yeah. You know, so they were always trying to hit that fuel depot. Did they ever get it? No. Not. but um that's good there was a world was a gnarly hit that we'll talk about but the the cash though so it was a chicken farm a chicken coop really but like a, it was you know it looked like an industrial farm mm -hmm. you know it had these really high fences really well fenced kind of better construction that you would typically see in iraq especially mm -hmm. in that part of iraq like really high level construction okay. I, would, I would say but it, it was basically yeah it looked like chicken coop chicken farms like big buildings and it was all in EFP factory and rocket storage. No kidding. Like dozens and dozens of the the nine foot one twenty twos. Yeah. Dozens and dozens of the one oh seven millimeters. I remember walking into a uh, seeing like barrels, barrels of primary explosives. Really? Bags. Just tons of bags of plasticized PE four. Um, so secondary explosives, right? Yeah. And then stacks, literally stacks of different sizes of copper discs that were pressed for EFPs, explosive form penetrators. Yeah. And that was where we were in Iraq was, they called it like EFP alley. Okay. That, that's, you know, from Baghdad's South all the way down to Toledo, there was a high threat. And for people that don't know what EFP is, explosive form penetrators were the enemy's way of defeating our up armored, you know, very expensive, very, you know, protective vehicles are MRAP, the mind protective ambush resistant. Right. Is that, am I saying that right? It's been a while. Yeah. But so that was, these weapons were designed to defeat those up armored Humvees, but you know, that, that EFP would turn into a, a bolt of plasma that would just fly right through armor. And you would have arrays, multiple arrays, different directions. So they could really just Swiss cheese a vehicle. Yeah. Um, I would say a, a good portion, I want to say half, but a, I don't think it was half, but a good portion of our calls were post blasts. Yeah. And, a, and, a, and enough of those were post blasts with casualties that, you know, it's just, um, you definitely want to do everything you can to prevent that. Right. And so getting more into the briefs and getting more into the intelligence side of it and really building what we could, like we, we would actually, you know, from the very beginning, meticulously process these EFPs and get as much evidence as we could. And that evidence paid off in this raid. That's awesome. They were to target this guy who was basically controlling this factory yeah. and he was a financier. Um, 
some type of there was some type of agency with Iran that they knew about. So Iran was heavily involved in Iraq. That that's most people don't talk about that, but yeah, Iran was fighting a proxy war with us through Iraq, through the Sunnis. Yeah. Right? And um but yeah, this EFP factory, I mean, there was I remember one like huge area was just all bed frames. I'm like, bed frames, because they would chop them and use them as um like modified rocket launchers. Gotcha. So they'd use bed frames and they just prop them up and set up the 122s or the 107s on these, you know, homemade like rocket launchers. And that's what you're lobbing in for IDF. They use like the same kind of timer you might use for your Christmas tree lights. They'd set these timers just to go off at certain times. They'd set volleys. Yeah. Because they knew that we'd do like a 10 to 30 minute cover. And then they would do another volley when they thought the cover mm. would be released. Yeah. So there was usually multiple volleys. The, uh, the technology that the bases had to track to basically backtrack that launch site and we get those right away and we'd probably be there within as fast as we could. Yeah. But we'd all be, we'd be off the base within 10 minutes of getting a call. We all, the truck was always ready. So my job mm -hmm. as a new guy was make sure that truck was 100% ready to go all the time. Yeah. Robots are charged, demos loaded, tools are ready, bomb suits clean. Comms are in back, there. Backup robots ready, comms are up. Yeah. ECM is updated because you had to do constantly, you had to do updates and then you had your, your comms package, you had to do your daily keys mm -hmm. for your crypto and stuff. So luckily enough, I was electronic technician yeah. in, the, in the communication side. So I was very useful yeah. to the team in that regard. That, the team is lucky because not, not every team has that. <laughs> yeah. And usually guys, I've heard on the show too, guys like, yeah, I was a radio man or I was this, I got stuck with this and I had to carry, you know, thinking back to like Harvey's episode and yeah. I love Harvey, but we were, and we go back, but yeah. um, yeah, it was, uh, Definitely, like you, you brought the talents you brought were the talents that they needed, mm -hmm. and everybody had different talents. You know, some guys were, you know, good with computers. Some guys were medics. Some guys were mechanics. Yeah. So that was like the fleetness. Having that fleet experience mm -hmm. would make a really diverse team. And the new guys coming in, they would just learn all from these other guys. But I think that new guys that focused in the rate, you know, became obviously became superb EOD techs. Yeah. And then they they just had other experience they brought back from wherever they, how they grew up, you know, right. but you know, then they would like specialize and you see guys that are just super good at different mission sets. Yeah. Cause we have so many things to be good at. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny when you can, you can see, uh, now, you know, it's been a long time since we've had a good amount of people that had a rate before come in. So now everybody is, you know, just an EOD tech. And then, um, you may be the comms person for that, but it's funny. You can see the, the chiefs that are like, okay, comms person, you're going to actually know about comms versus comms person, you're going to inventory comms and that's it, you know? <laughs> right. And it was still something to learn because shipboard comms is not the same as right. the green radios and army radios. So I would, I would, I would actually go to the army guys and get buffed up and ask yeah. them for their help. You know, it was no shame to ask for help. Yeah, no, not at all. Especially in that setting where like, it's their trucks, it's their radios really. Mm -hmm. So just find them and get them to help you out. Um, but so the cash, we found uh, booby trapped rockets and there was deep freezers buried in the ground. So I uncovered one deep freezer and got to do a, a pull, remote pull to open. Yeah. I'll crack it open and it's just full of mortars and more PE4. It's just like extra stuff that they had buried because it, like in case there was a raid. Yeah. And they could always come back to that location and dig up some more stuff to still fight with. Um, but yeah, because everyone was, we were, we had a team had dispersed. Um, one guy was clearing the living areas. One guy was clearing, clearing the, there was like vehicles, like multiple vehicles. And like I said, this is like an industrial farm. There's like mm -hmm. a lot of buildings. And um, so, you know, we cleared inside and then I started clearing outside and I found deep freezer. Uh, we found rockets that were suspicious. Like there was, looked like some type of detonating cord wrapped around mm -hmm. the ends. Yeah. And once you find something suspicious, like we're not going to really investigate further. Yeah. We just pulled back out. We got as much evidence as we needed to. Um, and of course the command, the army was like, do not destroy this location. And we're like, well, <laughs> we're not going to safely, we can't, we can't do what we need to do to consider it safe without endangering somebody. So yeah, we're going to blow this place up. And we, it was the largest detonation I've seen That's in awesome. my career. But we, we had, cause we had multiple things going off, but, um, this place had like an orchard, like fig trees. It was beautiful. And, uh, we just destroyed all of that. That's awesome. It came back. It looked like just a stack of burnt matches. <laughs> Those trees were still on fire. That's you know, we great. came back to clear the shot. Um, so I found one deep freezer. We rigged that up. You know, the rockets that we found, we rigged those up. Those were all gone. Whole big smoking holes in the ground. 
And then what I didn't find was another deep freezer that got kicked out of the ground. So we do the shot. Another deep freezer gets kicked out and everything inside of it had been littered across oh, this farm. So what turned in, so it was a, it was a daytime raid that turned into a very long evening of, you know, prosecution into yeah. a, you know, demo just after sunset into a, we're staying here very late at night, finding all this shit that Kron did. <laughs> <laughs> so my team wasn't super happy about that a little, little late night, uh, scavenger hunt yeah. for the rest of it. And then a second shot to get rid of that other stuff. Uh, but that was the biggest cash that, you know, according to, according to the records, that was the largest one in that province. Yeah. So that's kind of cool. It had that like little title. Yeah. That's awesome. You know, a lot of it, like I said, a lot of EFPs, a lot of live EFPs we took down, um, you know, rendered safe and collected evidence, which was super important Yeah. and still destroyed stuff in a safe way. Um, we had a, we had a demo range, we had a burning range. And we would even take care of um, the amnesty boxes. Okay. You'd find like, you know, like Mark 19 links, like 40 millimeter grenade links that yeah. people just throw in the amnesty box. I'm like, these need to be cleaned out some <laughs> often, a little more often. But um, yeah, it was uh, it was just such a, it was so much work. And it was such, you know, like I so said, we were blowing stuff up every day. If yeah. it wasn't on a call, it was because we were doing a disposal. We had a, we had an, like not an ICU, but we had a container, a buried container, just full of stuff that had been brought back that needed to be safely disposed of and we had our limits you know mm -hmm. our explosive limits for our range we had our burn limits and every chance we got we were doing something disposal burning on top of the missions and even on top of that <clears throat> after january i did with idf calm down a little bit and um, i started volunteering and we had uh, the army does med caps okay so for people that know med cap is when army takes a bunch of money and they go do who knows like you know shots and band-aids and education and and whatever they can, but this was like a continuous med cap where they would just supply a clinic. Oh, okay. And the clinic was treating um, women and children mostly who were burned yeah. from either home accidents or just casualties of war. And, um, you know, like small babies with like third degree burns on the side of their heads from, yeah. you know, women cooking and they cook with kerosene and there's accidents happen. Mm -hmm. Or even people that had been... Um, like women who had their hands burned as, as a, like a disciplinary measure oh, by their yeah. husbands. Yep. Um, really the saddest, saddest one was a, a girl who had been burned in a cook, kicking, cooking accident. It was just her, her father had three kids. His wife was gone. And um, his oldest daughter was kind of head of the household for that. She gets burned really badly. She can't cook. She can't even really walk. Mm -hmm. And so she's coming and getting bandages. He was roused up by, I want to say Al-Qaeda, but you know, the enemies is out there. Yeah. You can associate them however you want to associate them, but they're bad people. But he was beaten and shot in his legs for taking his daughter to see us Jeez. at an American clinic. And so I bandaged bullet holes in his legs for him. Yeah. Like it was, it was nuts. Like that place, that, that was really eye opening. And they actually gave me a, a volunteer service medal for that, for really? volunteering there. But I just started going there, you know, because it was something different. There were some, some cute medics would work there, yeah. you know, a good chance to just kind of, talk to people and not just do the EOD stuff. It was yeah. a good, it was a good break from the work as far as like, I can just be here and be something else. And I don't mm -hmm. have to talk about the EOD stuff. And plus my teammates, everyone kind of, you know, when we weren't on mission, people kind of like sequester and like decompress yeah. their own ways. Yep. And then this is like my kind of way of decompressing and still staying active. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. You get, you know, even like you're in the truck for 16 hours, you got to break from the Yeah, days. exactly. Like, as much as you love somebody, eventually you're going to hate them, you know? <laughs> so. I love you, but I hate this one thing about you. Yeah. Stop farting in the truck. <laughs> that sounds uh, very specific. <laughs> Good thing we're not using names. No, right? no shit. Um, that would have been me. <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> I feel like you would purposely eat beans just to be able to do that. Just torture my teammates. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, that's, uh, that, that's interesting that you bring that up like it you know for i feel like for some that would be i'm sure it was at some point like a hard thing to deal with right like, like going and, and volunteering there and seeing that extra stuff yeah, um triage yeah. on burns is legit that's like that's upper level medical care yeah. that usually like you know nurses like skilled nurses would do that mm -hmm. and then i get to learn that skill and that was really valuable but yeah they said like the routine of it and honestly it was the smell the smell yeah. of wounds like unhealthy wounds right. has a very distinct smell yeah. and it's not a good smell yeah and it's tough um there's there's you know a lot of care 
into the way we remove bandages, like, you know, gently, you know, wetting so they don't peel as much right. skin off. Um, very, very slowly, tactfully. And like, so doing some infants, infants to kids to adults. Yeah. And um, it was so rewarding, though, to see a kid come back and get his last bandage off. That's cool. Yeah. You know, see a baby smiling and laughing and obviously scarred, but yeah. healthy and happy again. Um, it was just so rewarding that way. Yeah. And that, that just made me, that's what made me keep coming back. That's awesome. And keep on through the rest of the deployment until March when we went home. Yeah. Um, also, I think another thing that, that made me want to volunteer was the, um, the worst incident we had in Iraq. And this is a theme, like we'll talk about therapy too. When you're in therapy, they, they, it's like, they have you pick what's the most prevalent issue. What's the first one? What's the thing you think about the most? Let's talk about that and let's write it down and let's talk about it again and let's keep writing it down. So I wrote this story down in, in journals over and over again. Yeah. And I've said this story many times, but, um, and I will drop names is it was, uh, second Lieutenant David Schultz was the XO of that troop commander of that troop. It was the you know, Alpha Bravo Charlie that would rotate through. Mm-hmm. But so he's the second in command of this troop and he's in his talk tactical operations center. Um, this one night in January and his platoon sergeants there with them. And they took a direct hit from a rocket from a 122. Yeah. Um, we were walking, it was myself and my, our team chief and our team leader, the three of us, uh, one of our teammates had stayed behind and wanted us to get him a go bag, you know, yeah. like, okay, we'll get you. So we're walking to the DFAC, just an average dinner. You know, we knew like, usually we get calls after dinner. So we'd eat kind of early, but after sunset, that's usually when the calls come in the OPs would be seeing activity. So we go out at night. Um, yeah, it was just kind of like an average day compared to like any other day in Iraq, I guess, but you know, that rocket came in, we were really close to it. You know, saw it hit, and it was like super close. So we just, we did hit the first shelter. Yeah. Cause we weren't sure if more were coming in and you wait a few minutes, wait a few minutes. And then I could see the glow of a fire. And I was like, that's on the base. Like that's inside the wall. Yeah. Usually it'd be outside the wall. If we're lucky, they'd, you know, a lot of times they'd hit like the tarmac. Cause there was like, you know, three different perimeters, one for aircraft to land in, one for the fueling station and one right. for the base. Yeah. Um, they had hit like other, parts that were not populated at the time, but you know, indirect fire is usually not very accurate. Right. But this time they had a, a direct hit into a tactical operation center for that troop. And, um, we got to the fire and I, we were probably the first ones there. There was some of the, a couple of army guys there. Um, a couple of guys brought vehicle extinguishers and were trying to get in access into the talk, but it was, you know, this is like a wood and fabric, yeah. wood and fabric building. So, so it just went up like a tinder burning, box. Yeah. Ammunition's cooking off. I could hear a grenade cook off. And so I'd started pulling the guys away. I'm like, we can't get in there. Like, I know you want to get in there and save them, but we can't. Yeah. And that decision haunted me. Cause you think about guys that are heroes. Like they just run into that fire, Yeah. run into that fucking fire and grab those people and run out. But when it's a real fire and it's really blazing and your ammunition cooking off and you feel that heat, like I knew that there was going to be more casualties going in there than you mm-hmm. know, coming out. Right. And it was just, uh, I don't know that was the decision I made. And that, then that decision really affected me as far as like, I should have done this instead. Yeah. I should have just wrecked, I should have risked my life and gone in there. And then I wouldn't be thinking about it all the yeah. time. Right. But, um, they pulled the tennis Schultz out heavily, heavily burned and he didn't survive the night. Uh, the brute, the, the team sergeant survived the attack. He was close enough to the exit where they were able to get him away from the fire safely. Okay. But, um, he was badly wounded in shrapnel. And the next day, we spent probably 24 hours on scene. We found every piece of that rocket. Really? Every last piece of it. And we put it all together. Yeah. And we knew exactly what it was. We were still able to get the serial number off of it, you know, for the most part. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, we combed and cleaned and stayed there. And I think that part of it was just because it had been such a massive loss for the 373. Yeah. You know, losing an officer like that. Right. Um, the memorial service was packed on base, you know, standing room only, standing outside waiting. Um, and then that, that's like set it that, you know, that was, so we got there October, you know, you spent October, November, December, and then that January is early, right after New Year's. Yeah. Like that was a huge wake up call. And then, like I said, we were lucky enough to, the, the Intel and the ODA put together that raid and we followed, we were follow on because we weren't integrated with them for that mm-hmm. deployment. But that raid really silenced the enemy. That's that, awesome. that Babel province, that, that cache. And then after that, like, so we focused, we still had response calls, still had, you know, explosive remnants of war getting turned in by the local police. We still had 
you know, IEDs getting called, but just very infrequently. But as far as IDF, like it was quiet at night. Yeah. And that got weird. Yeah. Because you just expect it. <laughs> yeah. Like when you're used to hearing something, mm -hmm. when you're used to something going on every time about the same time mm -hmm. and then it's not there. Yeah. It's like when you get your sea legs and you're used to the motion <laughs> and then you get on shore and you're like, yeah, uh, I thought we're not moving anymore. Yeah. But it's a weird. Yeah. You have to, you have to adjust back. You adjust back to yeah. something that's not as intense. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that, that's good though. Cause sometimes, you know, you, you go and you take care of a, a cash or something and you think like, Oh man, this is going to be that, that big difference. And then it like keeps going. You're like, shit, there's another, there's another one somewhere out there. Like now I got to go mm -hmm. after that. It's, it's gotta it's be a ending. good feeling though, that like you, you can see a noticeable difference. Yes. Yeah. It was a noticeable impact. That's and awesome. that's, and that was crazy. Like we just saw it. And, that, and honestly, by the end of that tour, I, I wanted to stay. Yeah. I was like, just put me on the next team that's rotating and I'll stay here. Yeah. You know, cause it was almost like when you think about the guys in 1944, they didn't go home after six months. Right. You know, they, they stayed a, until a week or two they, break. They, they stayed until we won. Yep. And that's what I think. Honestly, I think that's what we should have been doing is just plus up every, every year till we win. Yeah. Cause then you'll want to win <laughs> cause then everybody's going to work harder, <laughs> you know, not that we didn't work hard, but yeah, there's yeah. plenty of people that are on the fob just kind of going through the motions. Yeah. You know, we all yeah. know who they are. That's what they call them fobbits. <laughs> Uh, when you did come back and you, you switched on to, well, so you came back, did, where'd you go after that? Did you go yes. back to Mobile 11 or? I went back to Mobile 11 for just a few months. Okay. And then I transferred to Guam. Okay. So while I was on that deployment, um, the ops MC had called me and, and convinced me to take orders to Guam because I was single and Guam was ready to mingle. Yeah. He's like, well, you're a Liberty specialist. You're going to love Guam. I'm like. <laughs> I don't know if Guam's ready for me, but we're going to find out. <laughs> yeah. But I remember guys talking, you know, it's like basically a few of us that were single, no families went to Guam because 11 had basically was shuttering and moving. Yep. So they right. kind of put the guys that were still like really the very senior guys that had been homesteading and would be stayed the longest. Okay. And they deserve to. Yeah. Um, you know, so they got to be the ones to shut it all down and move it. Uh, a couple more teams deployed, but that would have been the last, the last teams deployed were after us out of 11 before it moved to San Diego. And then, um, yeah, guys like me went to Guam, but most everybody else went to like mob three. Yeah. Uh, out of Guam. Did you do, is that where you did your Afghanistan? Out of Guam? I did. Okay. Crazy. That's yeah. yeah. That's an interesting one. Cause Guam didn't really have an Afghanistan. For no, long, huh? no, we didn't. And that was, I was a very, that was a very special deployment. Like that Afghanistan happened because of what I did in the Philippines though. Okay. So when we, did a Philippine. So the Mobian five guys, the Jasota joint special operations task force Philippines mission was probably the best outside of Iraq. Yeah. As far as like real world experience, heavy yeah. work. And honestly, I was on the Island of Holo. So a team split up between Zamboanga mm -hmm. and Holo. So I was on a two men element in Holo and it was just jungle Iraq. Yeah. Same vehicles, same radio, same ECM, <laughs> same cruiser of weapons, just different color uniforms. And um, me and one guy and a bunch of Filipino Marines. Yeah. So it was, this was an ODA set up camp. So the just sort of mission that people understand is that you're working with army special forces. Right. Partnership is the name of the game. Our partners were Filipino Marines and we actually helped them with a request for forces. We tripled their presence, nice. the EOD presence for the Marines there and built barracks, helped them build barracks. And that's more of my partner. I don't want to name drop him because he's, he, he got mad at me back then for posting on Facebook. Really? You know what I mean? Like, okay, okay, OPSEC, I got it. <laughs> yeah. But um, he knows who he is. Hopefully you'll hear this and <laughs> remember I still love him. Um, very close roommates. You know, our, our office, our demo storage, and our bedrooms was one room. Oh, wow. So we just, we co-lived. That's know, awesome. It's, we had bunk beds. Um, Lots of love. Bunk buddies. We actually, we each had, it was funny, we each had our own bunk bed. Yeah. So like, top was like, you know, wherever you want to sleep, but we each had our own bunk bed. So you have storage, but it's that like, way two if you had your friend come room. over, you, could <laughs> you know, sleepovers. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. The, uh, in, in the Philippines, it was, you know, I wasn't really, I didn't, I guess I didn't understand besides what other guys that had been there told me. And they say things like you make your own work. Yeah. They say things like, you know, you have to show them what you can do. They're not going to ask you to do it. Yeah. Um, and so getting good at that, like creating work, creating impact through the training and the trust you build right. and then going on missions with the fills, providing them with the robotics and the explosives to do the job. 
and then being like a team leader. So it was, I was the LPO of a platoon. So I had one tour to Iraq as an EOD guy. Yeah. My second tour, I'm not only the LPO, I'm also the LPO, the senior tech and team leader and LPO for, you know, a team that's been branched out across the country. Yeah. So, you know, dealing with that administrative part, but it was just like, a, almost like a, a big leap for a basic tech to be on like a senior tech team leader LPO in their second deployment. Yeah. But I, like I said, I, by then I had over 10 years in the Navy. And so just more experience. Right. Right. Um, in the Philippines, working with those guys and doing those missions, you kind of have to get creative. So like the Phil's didn't have their own explosives, but we had captured enemy weapons. So we learned how to extract the explosives out of mortars. Yeah. And the, the same cardboard cups that the mortars come in for storage, we'd be basically cooking out the explosives and filling it into these little, and so they had their own drop charges so they okay. could do, cause they like to have in their own stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, they didn't want to just like, Hey Carl, I need explosives. Like, yeah. That's <laughs> super lame. If you're in a foreign military. <laughs> yeah. Hey, other military, can I please have some rounds and some ammo and some, you know what I mean? Like, so we got creative, um, with their, within their own budget, which was nothing. Giving them, you know, the tools to be more successful at least. And, yeah. and, they, and they were teaching us things like how to remove those explosives, how to demill because mm -hmm. they were doing the demilling part. We were the, doing the learning part. Like yeah. We didn't show them how to do anything. They showed us. And then we would show them how cool our technology was and how easy our job was compared to theirs with yeah. all the stuff and all the money we had. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And then they were doing, you know, we have like remote procedures or like a robot to place something remotely. They would use a very long line, two guys on it and like shimmy. Yep. So maintaining a safe distance, a bunch of times. Same, maintaining yeah. a safe distance still. And I was like, this is genius. Yeah. And the, the low tech methods I learned in the Philippines, I took to Afghanistan. Yeah. And then, so the, the way we got to Afghanistan, though, was, like I said, nobody from five was going to Afghanistan on like a mobility team. It just wasn't, the mission wasn't there. Right. The six, eight, you know, two, those guys had it covered for yep. the most part. And um, even the West Coast guys had a hard time getting out there. So the, the, they take a headshed though. They take a leadership team from each of the mobile units and they do the battalion deployment. Mm -hmm. So it was a mobile unit five battalion deployment. So the CO, can I say his name at the time? At the time it was Rob DeBuse. Okay. Um, and he took the, you know, the head shed or leadership uh, out of, out of mobile unit five. And they asked me while I was in the Philippines, like, Hey, we're going to go to Afghanistan. It's going to be like a month after you get back, but we really want you to go. Yeah. Based off the reports and the things I was doing in the Philippines. And I was like, yes, <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> and I didn't tell my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife and the mother of our beautiful children. But at the time we were dating, she was in San Diego. And I'm like, I went to San Diego after the Philippines and I'm like, Hey, you know, well, while I was in the Philippines, we decided, hey, you should move up to Guam. But I didn't have this call about Afghanistan. So then I see her. I'm like, hey, so by the way, we're going to move to, we're going to move you to Guam. But I have to leave. But I got to leave. So she literally moved to my apartment, living with my crazy ass roommate. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, good luck. Here's some friends. I'll be back in six months. Sorry uh, about this. You know, and she, sure she, she was, was like a trooper. <laughs> yeah. And, you know. You know, the way it was set up, like she didn't have to worry about much. Like she had yeah. access to funds. Like there wasn't like, you know, there's no hardship put on her, but she had a place to stay. She had access to funds. She had some people, you know, somewhat trustworthy teammates. Yeah. You know, it's like, I just don't drink too much around her. Don't harass her. Right. But, but you know, the whole money and, and my, you know, I could trust you with my money and my wife, but yeah, yeah trust my life and not my money, and my wife, but he was very much at five. It was all around trust. Like I knew those guys Yeah. and then, the, and their girls and their, and their wives and you know, the other, oh, plus, I mean, you know, female techs and, you know, everybody mm -hmm. that we had as a, as a community really came together, especially when it was the families or the loved ones of deployed members. Right. They were really looked after. And that's, that's what the good thing about five, two is that island. So 11 was an island, five was an island. So my, my two, I only did two mobile units and both of them were on islands. And you said you had that island community, a very tight knit community. Yeah. Both times. Yeah. That That's one thing that I like, you know, I had a girlfriend for, a little bit on, on Guam. And then I told her I was definitely leaving. So she got orders to, uh, San Diego and then I stayed for an extra two and a half years. Somehow we ended up getting married, but, um, <laughs> it was a little awkward for a while, but it, that's, that's one thing that I noticed, you know, it's like the family, the families hung out, the, the girlfriends hung out with, you know, other text families. And like it, it was, it was just so close. You, you had like this, close support network because nobody had anywhere else to go, you know? So mm -hmm. they were like, okay, I'm all in, you know? And like, even if you weren't like super pumped about 
somebody's personality, you learn to like them because <laughs> you're like, oh, I don't got any other options. Yeah. But it it was it was it was a good thing because yeah, you could. It was a lot easier to trust somebody like a teammate with your girlfriend <laughs> because everything was so close. And yeah. the Coast Guard was there. That was dangerous. Yeah. I remember, I remember, I remember seeing Coasties hitting on <laughs> wives of people who are deployed, and that caused some issues, yeah. some little fisticuff type issues. I'm sure. And that happened. <laughs> I mean, people would get jumped in Guam, too. That was a dangerous place. It and was, like, yeah. After midnight, you, you never knew. You yep. might you might find some guys from the fight club that want to throw in their mouth guards and just start beating on some white dudes. Yep. You know? You Literally, never, you never that knew happened. Those, you yeah. Knew, yeah. Yeah. I know two guys specifically that were, you know, hit pretty bad. Yeah. It, there was there was a it, literally an article in the paper about a, a a fleet officer out with his family and that happened he was in the hospital for like over a week out yeah. with his family his wife and his kids that's insane it, yeah that's insane that's just i mean if you want to throw down on someone sure but find some guys that you know yeah make it a fair fight as much yeah. as you can and i i mean i get there's a fight culture there's a lot of people that have mma and I've seen it. I've even seen it in San Diego where you go out and you see an MMA fight, and in the parking lot they're like rehearsing the next fight. Yeah, it's like oh, you guys got juiced up, like ready to throw some fisticuffs after watching it. You know, yeah, like weirdos. Yeah, <laughs> crazy. Oh, that's funny. I guess I'm more of a lover than a fighter, so I never really understood yeah. that. Yeah, I'm, you know? I'm the same way. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm not. It's not just because I can't fight. It's it's because I, I prefer to to love. Yeah, spread the love, baby. That's how you win. Love exactly. always wins. Exactly. There's a song about it. That's right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so you went into Afghanistan with the uh, so yeah, the head shed. To, the head shed, and I was going to be a training coordinator, and not really understanding what that job title was. You get there, and I meet the training coordinator, and it's like, yeah, you schedule people for the rollover, and you get them to the petting zoo, and you get them over here to the range for their qualifications. And I'm like, uh, no, no, we can find someone to do that. That's a scheduler, <laughs> not an EOD guy. Yeah. So we got. I actually found. Uh, it was so immediately the first thing I did was find a replacement for that job. And um, I found a grounded helicopter pilot who needed okay. who needed something to do. I'm like, hey, come over to this. That's perfect. You know, Task Force Paladin. You get a cool cool write up. You yeah. Be scheduling training, and um, perfect job for him. He got to work in the talk and became a really cool member of that talk uh, leadership team inside of that coordination because that was the big part of the battalion was coordinating all the EOD forces in that region. So right. we were um, RC South. So we were Kandahar Helmand, um, Aruzgan, Zabul maybe I think was part of that. Um, so multiple provinces in RC South, right? Yep. Regional Command South. And that was the EOD battalion. So Task Force Paladin was the, the EOD of all the country, right? And then mm -hmm. so we're Paladin South. And then um, we also did a lot of stuff West because there wasn't really a West uh, as far as a battalion head shed. Gotcha. And so coordinating teams, you know, where they're located, you know, army teams that have to swap out, um, you know, bringing teams in, make sure they're trained up and make sure they transport it over. And that's, battalion is a big responsibility to make sure people are out there doing their job, right? Yeah. Um, I linked up with guys from the same group that were in the Philippines, as far as the SF group guys that were out of Washington and Okinawa. Okay. And so they had teams that were in Afghanistan. We saw them and they had a need for EOD training for their partner forces. So that was immediately I went. So I got replaced, found a replacement because there was another bigger opportunity in partnered forces. And so I became the EOD kind of subject matter expert in RC South for partnered forces. And I built training teams. So I took guys, you know, I only had a handful of EOD guys, um, really literally like a handful. So it'd be like one EOD guy and then assistants that they trained. So non EOD contractors, um, infantry, we had a Marine infantry officer. We had, um, a British EOD guy that we swapped in yeah. Hellman's cause we sent a team to Hellman. And so okay. we got him and, um, and then I had, you know, even like our, our master at arms, I trained him up. So the battalion master at arms, I trained him up and he became my team, my training partner for building Afghan teams Yeah, that I took up. I took him up to Anaconda in the mountains of, I think that's the Ruzgan province is where that was in the mountains. It was nice. Cause in, in the summer in Kandahar and Helmand, it is as hot as it gets, yeah. like 120 degrees. And we did missions and we would do, you know, cause we would, we started, so we started in Kandahar with um, our first team and these were Afghans that had been hired. These weren't army regulars. These weren't Kandak special forces. These were like hometown heroes who yeah. were willing to do bomb disposal. And we didn't teach them really anything technical. It was, you know, identify and destroy yeah, and safely destroy and safely confirm it was destroyed. And so really like, kind of, we would say like the combat engineer type mission of like, you know, blow and go. 
Yep. But so yeah. teaching them those those techniques of how to remotely place a charge, maintaining a safe distance, how to remotely clear areas, how to look for lines of fire and check for, you know, command wires, how to do, you know, clearing up to and out of an area. Even even, even did some medical training as far as tourniquet applications and, um, you know, like you said, you're clearing in, clearing out, maintaining yeah. safe lanes, um, route selection. So like the real, the real meaty stuff that just kept people safe. Right. And not all the crazy EOD technical stuff that we had to train on all the time. So it was a really simple training package and you're teaching guys, these are Afghans that, you know, you're talking about like an 80 to 90% illiteracy rate. Right. So these are guys that can't read or write their own language. And so we had an interpreter, the, the second most knowledgeable instructor was the interpreter. Yeah. So I had to work, I would work with the interpreters, you know, off hours and make sure they understood the material because they're going to translate it. And it's not just, it's not just easy to translate. Yeah, that, you know, that's something a lot of people don't realize is like, especially with the, uh, the, if you have any technical words when you're going through a translator, if they don't understand what you mean, they're just going to make, it, make up. it up what they think it means. Yeah. And then you can totally jack somebody up. 100%. So it was really important for them. Like I would show them the tools and what the, how they're used and what they're used for so they could explain it in their own way. Yeah. So you had to teach. Yeah. And I was told the, I was messing the interpreters too. Like, Hey, if I go down, you're, re you're leading this team. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> They're like, you know uh, as much about this as I do now, <laughs> you know, you know exactly what these guys need. But so building the training teams was the first step. Um, getting supply requisitions was easy because the, it was based out of camp. I think it was camp Brown, which is right by Kenhar. Um, those guys just had it. Like, what do you need? We're palletizing. We're flying it immediately. You get priority for everything, priority transportation and supplies. And we were building, you know, um, what are those cardboard, like storage bins that they fly. It's like the same oh, size, like, like waffle a boxes. Yeah. yeah so yeah. we were just filling those up with demo. Tricons. With tricons. Thank yep. you. Tricons. Yeah. Look at that. <laughs> we got there. <It's> fresh memories. <laughs> but um, yeah, loading up tricons with, you know, not just a demo, but all the tools, the the line poles, um, having welders make things like grappling hooks. And then there was actually some pretty cool, like mini grappling hooks that were made, but I was teaching them how to use, how to drag grappling hooks, how to, mm -hmm. how to, you know, like every remote procedure you could think of that wasn't, you know, high tech. Right. And that's, that's what the focus of curriculum on. So I wrote this curriculum based it largely on like how do the British do four man clearing. Okay. And we ended up, that curriculum became a book called the dismounted smart book. Nice. And so when we turned over to mobile unit three, who came in as the next battalion, uh, Rob DeBuse had turned uh, Helmand and I can't remember what was out West, but Helmand and West became RC Southwest. And then Mobian 3 came in because an army battalion came up for the battalion to relieve five. Gotcha. And they got Kandahar, basically. Kandahar right. and then the two provinces, which is Aruzgan, Zabul. Um, so when we created RC Southwest and the guys that we had in, in, in Helmand with the Marines helped build that up. And then all of the curriculum that we turned over to them, they cleaned it up and they put it into a book. Yeah. And they, so they wrote the Dismount of Smart Book based off of what we built for them. Nice. Which is amazing to see that. You know, yeah. I see a published book and I'm flipping through the pages and it's curriculum yeah. that we had, you know, I can't take credit for all of it, but obviously mm -hmm. the stuff that we put together as a team. Right. And it was just a really good feeling to feel that impact again. Like you see impact, you see changes yeah. happening. And that's one wonderful thing about having a military career for a certain long time is you see changes and you, you know, what changes you're a part of, mm -hmm. you know, what changes you're resisting that you can't change to right. <laughs> so go with it, you know, but you do see impact. You do see things changing for the better. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that, that is, is good. And sometimes it's hard because you know that you're not going to be the beneficiary of the change, mm -hmm. but just knowing that the change happened and that people that are, that, that you know, and that are coming behind you are going to like, they're going to be safer and better for it. I had, I had compliments, um, and a Mobian three officer who had met my first, the first team I trained, the first group of civilians that I trained. And he's like, they, they call we called them, um, kayak counter ID action cell. Yeah. And I think they changed the name to something else, but that's what we called them. Kayaks. And they were like, dude, those kayak guys are fucking money. That's it's awesome. Like they, they do such a good job. And so then I did that same thing in Zabul with the team. I did the same thing in Aruzgan. Um, so I got to go. I went to three different, very far outlying fobs, trained up three different uh, teams of 16. So four, four-man teams. Yeah. And that's what we were built was four, four-man teams at each of these locations that they could rotate guys out and do the mission. And then we go out and do a verification. So verification means, oh, we all, you guys are about to graduate. We have a real, we have a live mission. I'm going with you. Yeah. And so I was a team leader and directing traffic and, you know, removing, pulling IEDs out of the ground or doing post-blast investigations. Nice. That's pretty cool. It was good. It was, it was, 
it was very unique where I was on my own a lot. Yeah. Like most of the time I was the only EOD guy. I wasn't the only guy from Guam, but I was usually the only EOD guy. Yeah. And then, so that created a gray area for, is Carl going out on a mission by himself as the only EOD guy? Yeah. Is that safe? No. Did he go through FET for it? No. Is that going to get the CEO in trouble? Yes. Are we going to report it? No. <laughs> yeah. So there was a lot of things that we did that we just did because yeah. we needed to get done. Not because we're going to wait for permission to do it. And I think that's, we can probably talk about that too, but you know, you hear the story about the 13 that were killed in the, in the pullout. Yep. They were waiting for permission to, to shoot. Right. Waiting for permission has probably killed more people than it helps. Mm -hmm. So, and, I've, and and like I said, I'm the Liberty specialist. So asking for forgiveness is always option one. <laughs> asking for permission usually didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that is, uh, you know, coming from, so one of the things that I, I'll tell people, um, you know, when they ask for like any kind of leadership advice, one of the things that was, that was done for me early on in my career. And I, I realized it, I just didn't put together exactly what it was for, for a few years. And then I finally like put together exactly what was done and why, why it affected me so much. It, um, I'd say one of my, my things that I look for every day and, and the people under me that are ready for it is finding something that matters to them, right? 3M matters, but it usually doesn't matter to the person, right? That matters above finding, finding tasks and jobs that matter to the person. Um, and that have consequences, not just for them, but for you, like as the leader, if you're putting yourself a little bit on the line for that, people will tend to, and they're ready for it. That's the, that's the big key, right? You can't just do this with anybody, but, and they're ready for it. They're going to, for the most part, understand that uh, not only do you have trust in them because you gave them this task, but they can put two and two together and be like, wait, if I screw up, like I get in trouble, but also he gets in trouble. Yeah. So we used to say protect the quarterback. Yeah. The CEO is a quarterback. Yeah. We're all running. We're all going to make sure we run shots and make sure we do things as clean as possible because his neck is always on the line. Exactly. And, and when you do that, you know, you're like, you're enabling somebody to do something that matters to them, which already they're going to want to do a good job. But then when they realize okay, not only do I have to do a good job because I want to, but I have to do a good, an even better job because if I screw up, something bad happens, you know, with, to somebody else, not just me. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, you're lucky if it only happens to you. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And yeah, like that's a, that's an awesome, like looking at that, allowing you to go out and be, you know, it's a job that needed to get done. It matters. Right. And then obviously it mattered to you. And so you're willing to like really dive into it to make sure that it gets done, it gets done right. And it gets done in a way that minimizes the risk that somebody the follow is. on risk. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. but, That's what we are. We are risk mitigation specialists. And, you know, we should talk a little bit about that transition time too, but then we'll get into it. But there's, there's, you know, people say like translating your military skills, Yep. like veterans, especially combat veterans or, you know, in the highest form of EOD combat veterans. Honestly, I hold those people in the highest regards because yeah. people don't understand how much we figure things out, mm -hmm. how much risk we mitigate, how much work we do behind the scenes and, and how much sacrifice we really make. And even like sacrifice and glory, yeah. you know, they talk yeah. about silent Absolutely. professionals. You know, we used to, we used to joke, like every SEAL gets a, a movie and a book deal as soon as they graduate buds, <laughs> you know what I mean? But every EOD guys, it's like, they are truly unsung. Yeah. You know, I, I was doing a thing last night and there is a, uh, he was a soft clinical psychologist and he, he got up and he was talking. He's, he's like, I just started getting into this EOD realm. He was like, it was interesting. I was doing a review for an EOD guy. That's, um, basically reclassing to a different thing. Um, and it was, it was super interesting and I'd never thought about this, but it makes perfect sense when he said it through the, the tests that he gave him, right. You then find out like one of the things that it tests is how, how detail oriented is this person and super detailed oriented, right? We all tend to be because if we're not like somebody gets hurt. And then another piece was how willing to accept risk is he, you know, 
And that was also super high. And he's like, that's not common. Usually it's, it's inversely proportional. Mm -hmm. Somebody that is very detail oriented is 10 tends to be afraid of risk. Yeah. And so like tries to not be anywhere near it. Whereas somebody that's kind of just like, oh, I just go through life and they're willing to jump off of skyscrapers without a parachute, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe not. I could think you and you guys have jumped off skyscrapers with parachutes yes. and got arrested in Malaysia for it. <laughs> Weird. But we can get into that one later. Yeah. There's um, so many Liberty stories for Liberty Carl. Yeah. It's a little trashy. But it's, it's, it's interesting because yeah, we, we are very, we understand almost every risk that's possible. And then we mitigate that. We don't just realize, Oh my gosh, I could die. I'm never going to do that. You learn it in EOD school, how to gamify, like yeah. where, where are all the risks? How am I making sure I'm taking care of all of the risks? And yep. they, remember we had those sheets. So you'd write out, I remember yep. by the time I was in air, I was just filling those out by memory. Yeah. You know, just like safety, 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 safety. Like, hey, we're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. And you just, you go through that and it becomes like a mental checklist that you do mm-hmm. all the damn time with yep. everything. Yep. You know, like I loaded up my van for a drive from Sacramento to here. Trust me, I went through that thing, soup to nuts, even like vacuumed it out. You know what I mean? But it was like, it was like I was getting the truck for Iraq ready and make sure yeah. everything's in there that I could possibly need in case I want to stop for a campfire, in case yeah. I want to stop and cook, in case I want to, you know, go for a bike ride or something. But yeah, I had. And it's, it's funny because you do all that, right? And that makes some people real antsy, like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, like I've got a plan for everything. Well, I could just stop here. Whereas when we don't do that, like you feel for it. me you oh yeah it. dude i literally feel I it in my gut. like oh we're, we're flying by the seats of our pants now yeah and sometimes it was good but you know especially you would always rely back on your training and you'd always rely back on your i mean even sometimes especially when you get really dumb when things get really crazy we had emergency checklists yep let's make sure you pull that out okay did i do this yes i did that okay, yeah good. exactly like the one little thing to look at just to make sure you're, st- you're staying on top because yeah when that adrenaline is pumping and you you start thinking you know you might start projecting like that fear that was his worst thoughts of what's, yeah. what's, what's, what's the worst thing that's going to happen. And like, you got to make sure you're mitigating those risks. So it doesn't, right? Yeah, absolutely. So you have to still work on that mitigation while in the midst of life threatening risk. Yeah. Which is, you know, super. Yeah. I mean, it's, that's, I mean, it's, you don't realize how rare it is because you're around teams of eight guys that can all kind of do it. Some are better than right. others. You're around commands of hundreds of people that can do it. And so we're concentrated around these like communities of, of real actionable, just very talented, very intelligent people. Yeah. And then you become a civilian. <laughs> and it gets better. And it's not even just rare. It's, not, it's not, Yeah, oh my God, so talented. Uh, as a, an employer of civilians, I can tell you I am not a fan. <laughs> not a fan of the civilians in America right now. And we'll get into that later. Yeah. But the uh, it's it's nuts, man. It's like you, you go through this high concentration of high high performers to the to the ocean of mediocrity that is America right now. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> backing up and I, I want to back up for, for a reason too. Cause I, I went to the Philippines, uh, a couple, I think two, two deployments after you. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I remember something happened down there that, that doesn't normally happen. You wrote it down in your thing. Um, you wrote down, you know, losing two green berets mm. and, uh, and the PI Marines. Yeah. Um, what, what happened in that? It was a very well-placed roadside bomb. They buried it in the road and they were using uh, pressure plates. Not like you would think of, you know, in, Af- in Afghanistan, we can talk about like components, right? It, as long as we're not into you know, like the saw blades, yeah, the yeah. saw blades in the side of a bi- bicycle tube, yeah. pretty common pressure plate or like pieces of wood with like wire yeah. and some foam separating. This was, uh, like a block, like a wood block with a, toothpicks holding up like a so imagine like the square peg yep. square peg square hole and then on the bottom is like a thumbtack and then a wire and then the other side is the other contact so it's a very simple yeah you know crush switch or contact switch um a big heavy and they were using ammonium nitrate aluminum powder as well which is an afghan ttp very common yeah. you know dry storage long lasting shelf life or primary or secondary explosive right the the vehicle that was struck they were unescorted they're just doing a fuel run from one camp to another. So it was like a Tuesday morning. Oh, they called us. They need fuel for the generators. So let's go run up a barrel of fuel. Yeah. And it was just two green berets and, a, and two fill Marines in a truck. And if we did it by the book, they would have had an EOD escort. Yeah. And so I felt responsible. Um, those guys were medevac to our camp in Holo. 
and perished. Yeah. Um, the Humvee was hit so hard that the turret flew off of it. Oh, shit. And uh, FBI came to investigate. The SOFA, the Status of Forces Agreement between the Philippines and America, was put into question. We thought we were all going to go home. Yeah. Like, they thought we were going to shut us down and send us home because we were not supposed to be out there doing combat missions, but it wasn't a combat mission. It was a transport. The road was trapped because they knew it was a transportation road mm. used by the Phil Marines. Yep. Phil Marines would go out there on raids, and they would get, like, legit raids. Like, they would be in firefights between dozens of people mm -hmm. in firefights with these, you know— at the time, it was the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, which segue to a joke. Yes, that spells MILF. <laughs> and yes, there was hats that said MILF Hunter on them floating around. Yeah. And I cannot, I cannot claim making those, but I did approve the graphics for them because yeah. it was my teammate. <laughs> the, the funniest thing, when I was on my deployment, uh, we were going into this area and I was driving our up armored Humvee, just going to do a demo thing. And, uh, and I look back and like there's this film marine with us right and he's he's literally sitting in the back of the humvee like holding his rifle like tight to him and i'm looking in the in the rearview mirror and you know it's it's like we're it's pretty off-road like really actually not the humvee ended up losing his transmission because it was it, an up armored humvee is not really supposed to maintain like that legit of an off-road area um but anyways i look back and i was like what's wrong and just dead serious with, with like, you knew he was legitimately concerned, but he looks up into the rearview mirror, right into my, eye, my eyes, looking in the rearview mirror and goes, this is the area of the MILF. <laughs> and I was like, it like so much of me wants to laugh, but like, yeah. I know he's a thousand percent serious. And it was actually very dangerous people. Yeah. Like that absolutely. was legitimately, um, the Philippines would, people don't understand, like there's, you know, uh, what do they call the the Catholics and the Christians that come down there for missionaries? Sorry, the missionaries. Mm -hmm. There's missionaries were kidnapped yep. by these people. Um, cell phone companies they would be extorted. They'd be they put IEDs on cell phone towers to yep. extort money from cell phone companies. They would um, they would just kidnap and rape people of the population. They would they were just pirates. Yeah, they're straight up old, just robbing and stealing and killing. To, to benefit themselves. Yep. And you didn't hear about it a lot in, in the news and it's, it's in like America. A secret, it's like a but, secret, secret Philippine civil war yeah. because they had very, you know, you're talking about a, an, an island nation of 3,000 plus islands. Yeah. And a lot of them are inhabited by people that are self-governing and they're also Muslim extremists. Yep. And that's that creates a lot of problems yeah. for local population, for, for the government, um, you know, just for people trying to conduct business normally. You know, these are, these are, I don't think there's an industry that wasn't affected by the activities of Jim Isleum. Am I saying that right? J.I. Mm -hmm. M.I.L.F. And um, there was also a communist faction that was also conducting yep. you know, the same type of operations. Yeah. Um, and all based in the southern, the southern third portion of the Philippines, going from Zamboanga south yeah. through Basilan. There's a movie about Basilan in the 80s. Yeah. This has been going on a long time. You know, I think like it goes all the way back to like General Jack Pershing yeah. in the Spanish American War. And we took the Philippines and there was unruly, you know, basically Muslim separatists that want their own autonomous region. They've always have. And when you're, you know, bordered to the largest Muslim country in the world of Indonesia, largest Muslim population mm -hmm. in the world, right? There's going to have those factions. They're going to have those, you know, yep. so there's extremists in every religious sect, right? Exactly. Violent extremists in every religion. Yeah. So we can't just, you know, it's not just like one or the other, but it's, you have to watch out for all of them. Yeah. hundred um, <clears throat> percent. So coming back to uh, Afghanistan, finishing up there, um, when you got back, then I, I don't know how much we want to go into the, the, the SIF side. Well, the, the SIF was interesting because it was, you did SIF versus Vice CRIF, right? They called it, they, yeah, I think. It was in that weird change over time, right? Right. Commanders in extremist force. Yeah. And I don't even know what in extremist means to this day. Yeah. <laughs> we were super cool. That's all I knew. They sent us to a lot of schools. Yeah. <laughs> to get really good at something that was scary as hell. Yeah. I mean, like, I remember training and like, I hope I never see a nuclear weapon in the trunk of a car. Yeah. But here we are. Right. Training to make sure we know what to do. Yeah. Holy shit, dude. 
Like talk about clutch your pearls kind of moments. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I couldn't imagine the pucker factor. You remember the pucker factor where you like, it's when your butthole goes up to your neck for the <laughs> people listening. And that's what happens when you see a live device. Like you train and train and train on things that look real. And then you see one for real and you're like, oh, here we go. <laughs> this one, this, I won't hear a buzzer. This is this. Yeah, exactly. There's no instructor to fucking scream at me after this one. Yeah. There's a, uh, it's that, that, uh, the realization of what did I just get myself into? Well, here we are. We did all this work, all this training, and now it's time yeah. to show what we got. And we did it, you know, and it's, that's pretty gratifying too. When you actually get those. Yeah. Right. When you come back from look at, you know, we broke it right. We got the evidence. We did everything by the book. We got the full report, you know, and, and, and push that onto the bomb data centers, the evidence processors, which yeah. builds the targeting packages, which creates more work for the shooters, which they love. Yep. You know what I mean? No more dry holes. Like that's what, in Afghanistan, a few times we had gone on direct action and it was, they call it dry hole where basically the target was gone. They'd already mm -hmm. moved on. So you're like, fuck. So now we're just looking for Anything. a lot of times we found legacy IEDs, not even like, not even like new ones. We found like ones that have been there probably since the eighties. Really? Yeah. They call them wow. legacies because they've been in so long that they don't actually work. Yeah. The battery's dead. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Like one guy hit, uh, we were on one route and it was dark and I had stopped to check something. They had moved forward past me and the, the team sergeant was in the lead and we're just kind of moving through. It's not a village, but like kind of like farm compounds Okay. and, you know, moving through fields. But anyways, he walks through a walkway, hits a tripwire. Um, his chest height is on a motorcycle switch, hits yeah. a tripwire and the tripwire sets off a blasting cap mm. and that blasting cap, the guy behind him jumps into the wadi into like a, it's like a, like a little ravine, right? Jumps in the wadi, dislocates his shoulder oh, and hurts himself dude. cause he just hears a pop. He thought it was like gunshot from yeah. inside. He thought the lead man just got shot and, um, the guys go in and yeah, team charge is really shook and we go and we look and there's, a like a, like a one Oh five in the ground. And I'm like, damn. Good thing that didn't work. Yeah. But yeah, that was like super sketch, but that's just a hazard. Like you really need to keep your eyes on a swivel, but yeah. you know, they, they set the trip bars so that the, the livestock doesn't set them off. Mm. So it's your Chester, Chester head heights. But if you're always checking the bottoms, yep. you know, I remember that. I remember training that and training it. They oh, yeah. set it at the helmet height because you need yep. to make sure you clear the whole doorway, yep. the whole entryway, not just the bottom where you think it's going to sound, you know, we, you know, Hollywood version of like trip wires for, are for toes. But yeah. Nope. Trip wires where you're not looking. Exactly. Yeah. I've seen them all different ways. And the, the, the creepiest is when you're going, you're going through and you don't see it, but somehow you feel it. You feel that like tension that you're like, Oh, like I just got so lucky, but now also I have to back out without setting it off too. But yeah, yeah when you can, when you don't even see it, because it's it is, it's up there and you're you're just doing this thing and you do that, and then after a while you're like you, you realize, okay, I'm up and down, like you, left and right. That feeling <laughs> of you're exposed to danger. Yeah. Like I'm in the midst of danger. Yeah. I, I remember feeling that really hard when you had a there was this uh at the Afghans that we were on a mission with, and it wasn't even like a route clearance, it was actually called in like a like a like someone had seen someone in place an ID. Okay. We're looking for 40 pounds of, of jug of 40 pounds worth of HME and jugs. Um, there was basically the report was, you know, someone saw the IED go out, not sure where they placed. We had a general area. We're searching the area and these guys on motorcycles, they had motorcycles with rakes and they would go around <laughs> in a circle and just, just to see if there's any um, command wires. Right? Yeah. Well, one guy, by the time we get there and I'm out of the truck and I'm getting my team ready that I just trained, it's like one of the verification missions. I'm like, okay, we're going to go find this IED. So we're getting them, getting the mimids ready. The, the metal detectors were ready. Um, talking about the formation, like how we're going to do this. We're going to do the two-man clearance. We're going to two-man approach. And um, while we're doing this, the motorcycle guys had seen something. And one guy, I see this guy walking up to where the suspicious item might be. Like oh, we're about yeah. to go clear. He's walking up this rake. I'm like, why is that guy doing this? Who is that? And then by the time I could even say, get him out of there, he drops the rake, sets off the IED, oh, blew dude. himself up. Wow. Just, you know, like you just see yeah. the rake come down and then it's just yeah. dirt. And yeah. Uh, this dude survived the blast what? with a severe concussion, bleeding, su survived it. Um, they got him out of there. And then I'm just sitting there looking like, okay, I'm going to go down and check this shot hole. I'm not sure if that was 40 pounds of ammo. Yeah. I don't know what it looks like. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. Like you can kind of guesstimate based off of like maybe the size of the hole, but it's also how much of it was, you know, burned or how much of it actually went 
you yeah. know, energetic, high right? Yeah. High ordered. And um, so without all that, you know, information, I'm trying to do my best to determine if that was the whole thing, if there's another one, so we go down to clear it. But I just remember sitting there like, man, if there's a time for snipers is right now, because they know exactly yeah. where we're at. Yeah. The, the shot just went Dude. off and we're like in a valley and just so exposed. And that really just kind of, that like crept in. And that was really hard because, you know, in Afghanistan, like we didn't get shot at in Iraq. Yeah. Um, there was an incident in the Philippines where someone had thrown a grenade at our, we were loading up pier side in Holo. We take supplies from the pier side. And while the trucks were lined up, someone actually threw a grenade oh, at really? our trucks. And it, so a grenade goes off. And then the Phil Marines were lighting the place up. Yeah. And I'm like, and my partner's like, incoming, incoming. I'm like, no, that's not, you'll hear it when it's coming in. It's not, it's all going out. Yeah. Someone threw a grenade and everybody just went fucking bananas. <laughs> and it was like, okay, just let them calm down first. We'll figure this out. But we got out of there. Anyways, that was the closest to like being, you know, physically attacked. Yeah. Every time we're out in Afghanistan, someone shot at us. Every time. I right. saw an interpreter get shot in the ass. Jeez. You know what I mean? Like I, I've, it's, it's there was sniper fire. There were sniper battles. And that's, that was the exchange. Like I'm, I'm in Afghanistan with a M4 with like a 12 inch barrel. And I'm like, this thing is useless. <laughs> yeah. Cause the only people doing any type of, um, you know, shooting back were, were had like, you know, seven, six, two rifles, the scar mm -hmm. heavies or, or the EBRs or, or some kind of sniper rifle. Yeah. And, um, so it would just turn into like, we dig in and let the site sniper sort it out until we can maneuver. Yeah. Snipers keeping busy. Then you maneuver. And then the action cell, the, the, you know, the assault team would maneuver in and, and take them down and we kill or capture people Yeah. almost unless it was a dry hole, but we'd be out there, they would kill or capture people. Yeah. And there was all those guys, I mean, three guys would take on, we we're like 50 people strong Yeah. between the ODA and the, all the Afghans we took out. It's like a huge element. That's crazy. And they just take it on. They don't care. That's so nuts. Yeah. Just to not care. Like to, to have to know that at some point you're just going to die. Like, like me and you, Oh, there's 50 guys out there. Let's go get them. Yeah. Let's, and they, <laughs> like the smart guys, like, let's get the fuck out of here. Yeah. But you know, they were, they were just you like, go we're, first. We're, yeah. <laughs> I got your back. <laughs> Oh, that's so that was a big difference. So that, and that, yeah, that exposure feeling was, was not good, but yeah, I think I was fortunate enough in Afghanistan. I wasn't exposed as often as, you know, it might seem like there was plenty of time where I was on the fob doing my work, yeah. you know, curriculum building or running training on safe ranges, you know, running training inside of safe areas mm -hmm. and very limited exposure to the enemy. Yeah. That, that's gotta be kind of weird though, that like you're, when you're there, you're like pretty much good. You know? Yeah. You, you got to worry about some things, you know, but then knowing that like, all right, we're going out, we're going to well, get shot at some point, you yeah. know, shot at at some point. Well, that, the guys that were the battalion before us, it was a moving 11 had to the battalion before moving five Yeah, for the task force pilot in the South in Afghanistan. And the, the guys that we turned over with were guys that were running readiness and training when I was there as a, as a platoon guy. Yeah. And uh, so I knew them, I knew the, I knew the chiefs and the senior chiefs that were there, the warrant officer that was running. Basically I, you know, I took the same job that the senior chief was doing. And then we had a Lieutenant. Um, I don't think he's active anymore, but I still won't drop names, but um, our Lieutenant had basically taken the, the lead seat for partnership efforts. And then of course we had another Lieutenant and then myself and another active duty EOD guy. So the three of us became the three team leaders that went to different places. Mm -hmm. But between the three of us, we hit up like, I think eight locations to, okay. to train teams. Yeah. But um, yeah, kind of segue into that description, but um, I feel like we're off target. What what was that? We say again, it was. Uh, well, no, we, uh, I was just mentioning that it's gotta be weird to like know that every time you're going out, you know, when, Oh, when sorry. Duh. Yeah. The whole point of my story, but talking about when we look, they told me, like he was like, I'm so sick and tired of getting shot at. He's like, every time I leave this place, I get shot at. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, that's the danger. He's like, it's real. Like they will shoot at you. They shoot at everybody. They take as many pot shots as they can. Yeah. And that was a real thing. And, and you go out in those missions and you know, the, the team commander, you know, it was take cover frontal and overhead, you know, moving with, with purpose and always making sure that if you're, that you move into, um, cover. Yeah. You never be exposed. Yeah. Never just stand out there in the wind. Cause they're gonna start shooting at you. That's a, uh... I know that a lot of that came into the training that I had because, you know, especially at the training units too, they started, there was a big push to like train people, the difference between cover and concealment and uh, starting used to paint and all that so that you didn't get young EOD techs. Man. Like 
being like, I can work in the doorway for 16 hours. I remember, I remember catching a cold <laughs> paintball behind my ear and like just pitching a fit. Yeah. How did you get me? <laughs> you know, cause it's just like, a, you know, through like a, around a building, through a window, caught me right in the neck. Yeah. And it was like, that stung so damn bad. And then I realized like, yeah, you think you're covered? You're not. Mm -hmm. You better make sure you're covered. Yeah, I got one. Um, I mean, I don't know how it went through the, the mask that I was obviously wearing, but literally right on my lip, Oof. split it open. Was it a sim or a paintball? Uh, it was a sim. Yeah, those are sharp. Dude, it, it went in. It split it open immediately. We're like, we're on the outside of, of a mount town, like, or I should say in the middle of the mount town, walking uh, on the outside of a building. The dude from a second story is like, bop, got him. Nobody had seen him, right? So then we're like, man, you know, shooting, doing our thing, right? Trying to get cover, trying to move through. We end up in this building and like, you know, when you get hit, you feel it, right? But I didn't know how bad it was. So I'm sitting there. We got our cover. We're inside a building and I turn around and I spit and it's just like this huge wad of blood. And I was like, oh, that got me. <laughs> it looked like I yeah. had the hugest like herpes sore on my lip. It's like, <sighs> you explain that one at the bar. You're right. No, it's paintball. <laughs> yeah. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Stay away. Yeah. That's hilarious. I remember doing those debriefs too. Like we never thought we hit the instructors because they would wear like the man dresses and, yeah. and obviously the safety gear. And then you'd be shooting at them. You'd see them like a ghost and you just light up the whole area. And then the, it was always satisfying. Like we do a debrief and I'd see him with pain. Like, I'm glad I got you. Yeah. I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. Cause you got me like a motherfucker. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you, we did uh Oh God. Sorry. I'll tell this and then I'll be, I'll be done. Um, talking about like never hitting the instructors and you know, like, of course they know the areas. Right. So they're like, pop out of a window, get you, move here, move there. We were doing a, um, we were doing a thing and it was us and an NSW team. And I'm pretty sure it was, uh, it was Chris Moscow and his team. Um, sure. And so we didn't have enough paint to do both of our teams one more time. So the instructors are like, all right, you guys, you're going to go. So my team, we're going to go. Um, we had to, you know, you do a, walk down the road to the Mount town and then you have to, to go somewhere. I, there was some objective that we had to do. And, uh, when the instructors left, we're like, all right, split up our ammo NSW team. You're going to go way around. We're going to keep comms. And then like, we're going to flank and we're going to jack up the instructors. It worked perfectly, man. They came around. It worked a little too good. So we finally get to them. We're like, hey, we're over in this building. So they come over. They've got one of the instructors hogtied. And one of the dudes is literally carrying him on his shoulder. Damn. And when we moved him through, he was pissed. That's amazing. But it was, yeah, it was like, talk about a good bonding moment. Hell yeah. <laughs> I remember, I don't know if they were wives' tales, but I remember hearing about the NSW guys at like, um, what was the sort of seer training? Yeah. And taking over a seer camp. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> basically just like pirates of the caribbean now we're in charge <laughs> yeah. you know and that's an amazing story i don't know if it's true or not i hope it is yeah but yeah nsw has got some legendary stuff that, you know they said yeah just train to fight yeah this is what we do for real <laughs> exactly um yeah so after that uh after that sif team you got a short duty after that i went to the training unit training unit, yeah, my, training my, unit my last one, right? my last duty station was okay that. yep yeah and then uh out of there some interesting things may have happened. Yeah. I think, you know, you could say I hit my breaking point. Yeah. Mentally. Uh, there's a lot of things going on too. It wasn't just the Navy. I can't blame, I don't like blaming anybody. I blame myself for making decisions to manage stress the wrong way. But, um, yeah, my last, last deployment was the SIF where you travel around the country and get to go to the cool schools and do the labs and learn stuff. That's like, you know, space force EOD basically. Yeah. Like you're learning some really crazy stuff. And, um, applying that through training and applying that into massive training, uh, you know, with like Australians, mm -hmm. big operations where they're practicing, looking for, you know, the, the counter proliferation mission of we're keeping, you know, radioactive and, and well, basically any type of weapons of mass destruction, right? So biological, chemical, radioactive, radiological mm -hmm. hazards, you know, not just, not just like finding and prosecuting those types of like clandestine labs or, or improvised, you know, weapons of mass destruction, which would be just terrifying. Yeah. Honestly, like thinking about a chemical dispersal device that you're training on at the training unit. Like, right. I'm like, Oh my God, I 
I couldn't imagine. Yeah. <laughs> this is a real deal. Like how, how intense that would be. But, um, you know, just like probably the best training in EOD, the best schools, the yeah. best training. That's, that's the real benefit of those, those, um, you know, CRIF or SIF teams that both coasts get to do is you really end up with some like exceptionally smart operators right. who can, you know, really ratchet up the training to make it, you know, like EOD versus EOD and training. It's yeah. obscene versus what a bomb maker is going to do something to make it, you know, safer, like someone to emplace it. But, mm -hmm. you know, I'm making neck bombs for guys and I'm going to make sure they work. Yeah. <laughs> and I probably would have died putting them on. Who knows? Yeah. Right. It was too good. <laughs> but, you know, that was always the argument. But, um, yeah, so I, I did my third deployment out of Guam and then transferred about six months after that. When I got home from Okinawa, so you, this is the, the, that team, it was based out of Okinawa. You go to you go up to Tori Station, you're stationed with those guys. Yeah. And then you travel all over Asia with them doing these J sets, these missions of training with partner forces and, mm -hmm. you know, Malaysia, Indonesia, um, Australia, and, uh, I had left uh, a pregnant wife. So kind of in between Afghanistan and then leaving for training um, or leaving for deployment, there was, a, there was also like the, you know, all the schools, the team training, after team training and getting back ready for deployment. Um, before coming back to Guam from San Diego from team training, I yeah. got married to Sharon. And we... Um, you know, go back to Guam and she's pregnant. I do my master board. Yeah. I leave for deployment. So she has seven months without me basically. Yeah. And then I get home the day I got home, Cora was born. Really? So they actually sent me back a little bit early. Um, my replacement was ready to go. So they sent him out to Okinawa. Nice. I got to leave a couple weeks early because the due date was approaching, but it was something about you know She was early, but I, the day I got home, you know, we fly into Anderson uh, pretty early in the morning, I'm back in my condo at like 7:30 in the morning. But you know, you know, you get your bags, mm -hmm. say, "Hey, thanks for the thanks for the fun times." You know, I'm gonna go on go on my leave, and uh, got home, and I just like literally opened my bag. <laughs> hit the thing, I'm not supposed <laughs> to hit the thing. Open my bag and show, you know, just because you always have souvenirs and gifts, and yeah. it, was, it was my my wife and her, uh, my mother-in-law, her, her mother Andrea was there, and um, yeah, and I go like, "Oh, I'm gonna take a nap. It's been a long travel because I went from I lived from Australia." to Okinawa to pack to Tokyo to Guam in like within like a 30 hour period. Yeah. And, um, so I'm, I'm just kind of resting and then I can hear them talking about the water's broken. And so, yeah, it was a really, really surreal moment. Like the day I'm home from deployment, yeah. my daughter's like, I'm here too. <laughs> I'm coming out. I'm coming out of this. Let's go. And, um, so yeah, I was there for the, my, my daughter's birth and I was lucky enough to be at the birth of both my daughters, but that's cool. So Cora was born and then six months, so I was in an R&T and that's probably where we spent a lot of time together. Was, yep. I was in the R&T shack with, you know, we were all doing our thing and help with the tunes and you were, I think you were on platoons that we were doing training with. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, we transferred to the training unit and I went to the IED division of the training unit as a, just a chief master tech instructor. You know, so go through journeyman instructor training, which is actually pretty helpful. Uh, go to the training unit, working in IEDs for about a year. And during this time, um, I, you know, Sharon became pregnant with our second daughter. Um, the stresses of a baby in the house and the move and coupled by the, the fact that, you know, I was the Liberty Hound yeah. and I didn't change that yet. Yeah. Um, it created a lot of, it created that dynamic at home that was, you know, stressful yeah. for both of us. And then you compile that with the training unit demands which are pretty high. Yeah. And then, you know, I, I get promoted my first year there. I'm only a chief, only been a chief two years. And because I'm an EP, I really mm. promote on my eval, I get selected for eight. And I didn't submit a package because I really wanted to just not be in charge of anything for a little bit. Yeah. You know, cause I was a team chief for three guys. I didn't feel like I should be a senior chief yet. Yeah. You know, and I was team chief for three pipe hitting, super reliable guys yeah. like i didn't have disciplinary issues besides my lieutenant and my lpo wanting to fist fight one day <laughs> it happens it happens <laughs> pull the car over like we're not pulling over <laughs> just get over it guys you're not i'm not gonna let you fist to cuff each other i'm not fucking explaining that to anybody 
Oh, so yeah. So I talked about it a bit. Um, God bless their souls. They know who they're, they know who they are. <laughs> they, uh, but yeah, the training unit, you know, promoting to eight and then they needed, they needed a senior chief in underwater and they asked me to do it. Okay. And this is, you know, Liberty hound, fun guy, Carl, probably not the most serious type. Um, did one MCM assessment in Guam where you literally, as soon as your face hits the water, you could see the mines. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> it's true. It's, it's 100 feet down there. I got it. It's no problem. I don't even need this gear. I'm going to figure out this. Just give me the charge. <laughs> Take this visual scanner back. I don't need that shit. Yeah. yeah um, so true. It was like ridiculously easy, right? I wouldn't say like nothing's easy, but I'm saying as, yeah. as far as like as, as difficult as the mine countermeasures mission can be as challenging and as complex and with like all the layers of complexity with things that could go wrong. Mm -hmm. It's insane. Yeah. You know, I mean, lots of lots of things can go wrong, right? The more equipment, the more complex, the more things go wrong. Yep. The, you know, putting me in charge of that division where there's real MCM teams, you know, with, you know, honestly, like junior guys on MCM teams are probably more MCM experience than me. Yeah. My all my instructors had more experience than me. And I just felt exposed again. Yeah. And I was having issues that I weren't really tracking. Um, but yeah, I was avoiding, I had, you know, in therapy, they call it avoidance behaviors. But, you know, basically having some beers at lunch because you feel stressed isn't the answer, right? You yeah. know, it's like for me, I was just avoiding uncomfortable feelings by numbing them out with alcohol. Yeah. And it got to a staggering point of I'm drinking every day to a point of blackout. Really? And, you know, it having two babies at home, a wife that's stressed out, I'm working 12 plus hours at a training unit, my shore duty. Right. Um, the demands of a running a department that I'm not familiar with, coupled with just the type of leadership that would hammer you for mistakes. Mm -hmm. And it just all became overwhelming to the point where, and I'll say it on the air, like I was suicidal. Yeah. You know, I was ready. Multiple times I thought about like, how do I end this? How to make it look like an accident? Yeah. How do I make sure my family's taken care of? Because I just can't handle all this shit anymore. And it, it, it was such a such a fear inducing feeling that I would run away from that feeling too, and get blacked out drunk to avoid it. Yeah. And so this spiraled out of control to the point where, yeah, I got in trouble. You know, I won't, won't get into too specifics with it, but yeah. you know, if you you break the rules of the Navy, there's going to be good order and discipline has to be administered. Right. There's no excuses for that. You know, there was obviously every resource available to ask for help, but in our community where that type of help is seen as weakness. And as soon as you, everyone is afraid of once you have a diagnosis or you're on medication, no more clearance, no more weapons, no more EOD, you know, who knows what happens to you. Right. And I had to lose my crab and my job before I actually sought help. Yeah. So once, once I lost the thing I was protecting the most, which was my career protecting, you know, I could pour myself into my uniform feeling like absolute dog shit and still crush a day yeah. as senior chief Kron. Like senior chief Kron, nothing was stopping that guy. Carl was very sad, very stressed out, very lonely and not knowing where to get help from. Yeah. Not going home to a, a copacetic peaceful household, not coming into work, feeling like I have a, a confidence in what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, all those pressures where there's no outlet, you create outlets. And the outlets that I created were very unhealthy. Yeah. Got me into plenty of trouble. Crimes were committed. Yeah. You know. And so in therapy, though, like you kind of lose everything. You can, you can refine yourself. And in losing my career and in finding myself, I was able to save my family, save my marriage, save my own life. And focus on the things that really makes Carl who he is, Yeah, you know? And, and that's kind of how I found that, you know, just serving others. When I was uh, in therapy, you do a lot of individual therapy, you're doing groups, you're doing, they give you a medication, they put you through cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a type of journaling, journaling out your thoughts and why do you think that way and why would you not think that way or why, would, why should you, you know, may, how else can we think about that? Um, really helping you with that thought process of like, you don't need to spiral out of control because mm -hmm. you have a bad feeling. Right. You know, every emotion comes from a thought and you can control your thoughts. Yeah. Ergo, you can control your emotions in a certain aspect, right? Yep. Um, you know, going over the stories, like the one with Iraq, um, some of them, 
kind of like the guy that blew himself up in Afghanistan, that feeling of, you know, that overwhelming fear that you have to just kind of push through on scene. The, um, the horrific stories, losing friends. You know, I mean, we tattooed at 11, we tattooed a saying on our wrist here. It says, to the six from 11 and 07. Like sacrificing those types of guys, losing yeah. EOD techs, like people don't understand how valuable an EOD tech is. And I'm telling you, if you're active duty and you think another guy's a piece of shit, I would take the biggest piece of shit EOD tech over any civilian. I've, I'm almost any civilian, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, trust me, like, there, at least there's a baseline of intelligence there. And it's a like piece of shit. And, you know, we always had like some reason to brag on someone. Yeah. But if you made it through training, you're pretty solid. Yeah. If you made it through deployments, you're pretty reliable. Um, a lot of guys crack. And I think it's because they're trying to still stay perfect mm -hmm. in a, in a defect, like a zero defect mentality where when there is a defect, that defect has to go somewhere else yeah. because all these stacked up platoons are obviously not defective. But they are. There's all kinds of problems. That yep. we, there's all we deal with problems every day. We deal with mental health issues. We deal with emotional outbursts. We deal with liberty incidents on a regular basis. Yeah. And that's navy wide. That's military wide. But the projection is: look at how amazing. Look how accomplished. Look at all these mission areas we can we can execute with with high precision and a, and a very high confidence level for success. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, you lose teammates. You see the wars going the direction they shouldn't be going. You see the, you know, the political scene and the, and the outcomes that are different than what we were really fighting for. Mm -hmm. And all that weighs on you. But, um, you know, for me, it was avoiding things, thinking that, you know, I could party my problems away. Yeah. And, and that was obviously a huge mistake. Um, when it comes to therapy, like, I don't think guys need to really, maybe you don't want to talk to the therapist. You know, honestly, obviously it was at the time of the training, it was two guys, two older guys. And I just didn't want to go to a, a stranger, a mm -hmm. male stranger and be vulnerable as a man. Yeah. You know, it's not easy to be vulnerable with other men around each other. What did help those when I talked to a female a licensed clinical social worker. And I remember specifically, she just asked me, we we're talking about um, incident in Iraq. And she's like, well, how'd that make you feel? And I just broke. I started yeah. crying. And I'm like, nobody's ever asked me that out of all the times I've told a story about this or that, or being scared to death or almost dying or, you know, recovering people. Yeah. Nobody ever asked me how I felt. And it's such a simple question that we just don't talk about, you know, and getting into those feelings and then being able to process that, finally having that cry, finally having that emotional reckoning mm -hmm. and it just, you feel renewed. So yeah. we need that. We need to create space to allow that. Yeah, absolutely. And we need to create safe avenues. And if it's not that, then it needs to be, you know, a very, we need to be, have those open discussions amongst our teammates. And I'll say the best therapy, as far as like me feeling connected and me feeling um, a relief from the stress was surf clinic. So they would take us to Del Mar um, from the, the wounded warrior battalion yeah. from the hospital, we, you know, and I was volunteering. I helped organize the, but they had, you know, um, surfers that had volunteered as surf instructors. They had donations from boards. Um, there's also another group called Ride to Recovery. They did the same thing with mountain biking. Okay. But mountain biking groups and surfing groups. And yeah. that's where I was just like, here's a healthy outlet. Here's a connection with someone that's not in the military. I can talk about stuff. And they're going to ask me, wow, what was that like? Yeah. Wow, that sounds crazy. Oh my gosh. How'd that make you feel? You know what I mean? Like real questions. Yeah. You know, like we don't ask those questions. How to make you feel like, oh, you survived. Oh, you, oh, you're lucky. You lucky little son of a bitch. You know? Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. like, whatever. You barely got out of that one. You right. Know I mean? And you know, we always we always joke about it. For us, we use. I think we use humor Absolutely. as a as a shield. Yep. For the pain. You know, and the pain that we feel for loss and the pain that we feel for grief of decisions that we think had gone better. Yeah. You know, the pain of of you know, watching your work kind of go down the toilet, mm -hmm. like when the Taliban takes back over. You know, and like, yeah. what the fuck did we do all that work for? Yeah. You know, and it's just hard, especially, you know, me as a civilian, seeing all that go down was, was, you know, I'm at home by myself too. Yeah. So the, the therapy had to continue. I had to find healthy outlets. And, and I did find that in my local gyms in building communities because it's that community, that connection and that being of service to other people. Mm -hmm. That's where I really healed and found, found like a peaceful existence without yeah. all the darkness. You mentioned the uh, 
the feelings part portion. So it's, it's interesting you mentioned that because just recently, and, and the reason why I talk pretty openly about like, I go at least once a month and, and see uh, the therapist that's, you know, for um, that we have at the strike thing now, which is, yeah. it's, it's, I'm glad we have it, but it's frustrating because I, I can see, I can think of like, literally names and I can see people that I'm like, man, if we, if we had pushed harder to have this earlier, like there are people that li literally their careers could have been saved because, because of things like what if Cooper could still be alive right now. Exactly. E exactly. You know, there's, like, there's guys I can name right now that yeah. would be alive. Yeah. If we really honed in on people that are isolating yeah. and avoiding yep. and going down a downward spiral. And and you talk about the the feelings portion. You're right. Like most of us don't talk about that, think about that. And um, I was talking a month ago, a month and a half ago. Um, and I don't remember what I was talking about, but she's like, how'd that make you feel? And I'm like, uh, I don't know. You know, like, I don't know. It's, I never, so, never took time to process that. Right. And she straight up like pulled out this, uh, pulled out this wheel and didn't let me like, didn't let me just sit there and think like I, I always try and do, you know, cause a lot of us try and do that. We try to like figure out the right word, the right way to say, right. What's going to be the answer that gets me out of this question. Yeah. And she took this uh, wheel and was like, does it make you feel this? Does it make you feel that? Does it make you feel this? And like, just kept going. I'm like, I'm like, I, I could feel myself like getting annoyed. And then like, without thinking, uh, like just going to the one that, I think. Right. And I'm like, but I can't remember. Right. But let's say sad. Right. And she's mm -hmm. like, why did it make you feel sad? And you know, like she's forcing it and it, it mm -hmm. makes perfect sense. Forcing I didn't understand at the time, but yeah, she's like forcing you to not think about your answer to just respond with. And, and when you do that without like processing everything, then you're getting it, the real, like, yeah, you remove the bullshit filter. Exactly. And, and I always felt like I was pretty good at like one of the things when I decided to start going, one of the things that I told myself is like, I'm, I'm not going to hold anything back. I'm not going to lie about it, but we just have so you get so used to not, not even thinking about that question. How, how do you actually feel? Right. And, uh, you get so used to it that you can't, you can't explain it when that question, that simple question comes up. Like, are you sad? You're like, I don't know. <laughs> You're like, what do you mean? You don't know. Like, I really don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it makes me sad, if it makes me angry, if mm -hmm. it makes me frustrated, you know, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, like I said, it's, it's good that we have this. And then, you know, when, when you talk about the, uh, the, the surf therapy and, and that, find communities outside of the military community that will support you and yep. accept you for who you are out of uniform. Yep. We're really good at accepting each other in uniform and being impressed with our ribbon stacks and being impressed with our badges and being impressed with, you know, your starch cover, or whatever, yeah. you know what I'm saying? But when you're out of uniform, it's like, who, who's that real person? Because eventually everyone that's active duty right now, you have to realize that eventually that uniform is going to get hung up in the closet for the rest of your life. Yep. And you have to be the person who you really are. Yeah. And so finding who that person is now is going to help you not just transition out of the military. It's going to help you process your traumas. It's going to help you. And you know, I, I think there's words too, like trauma, like, you know, seeing therapists, there's words that are associated that we don't, you know, like, oh, I don't need that shit. Mm -hmm. You know, a macho guy's going to be like, I don't need that shit. Um, and it's really just think of it more as like, um, as like changing the oil in your car, you know, it's got some build up, how, yeah. to, how to clear it out. You know, we got, we're running, we're, we're running hot. We're, we're not as fuel efficient. We're not as, as energetic. We're not as optimistic as we once were right why not it's because we need to clear out our head yeah and finding a community that supports you as who you are without your uniform on in some activity some type of physical activity where you're connected with nature that's it man like there is there is a true medicinal value to having friends yeah and being outside yeah it's fucking crazy and it's that simple but sometimes it's that hard to remember that it's there for you yeah i lived in san diego i had teammates, roommates, friends from EOD school, friends from the Navy that I could be completely open and honest with. I never had to hold anything back. And I decided to hold back. I decided to restrict because I don't want to be a bother because I don't want to be a, a downer. Yeah. 
I don't want to be a wet blanket. I mean, I lived, I could have, I mean, I lived in, on, um, Pico street at Admiral Hartman housing. I could have just gone to the beach every day and surfed every yeah. day. I could have got up my ass up early and done it every day. If that's what, if I knew that was what I needed, if I knew mm -hmm. that there was going to be, uh, an Avenue there outside of me just, you know, drinking to, yeah. to forget. It, it, man. So you said, you know, you didn't want to be a burden and dude, I feel that I know a bunch of people feel that way. And it's funny cause. And that's just depression, man. That's not true. Right, exactly. And like, I can, I can say with a hundred percent certainty without anything to back me up with that, that if you at all feel like if you bring something to, to a close friend and it's going to be a burden, I can guarantee you that person is not going to think of it as a burden. Like if you're thinking about no, that, they might, they might be a little worried, but it's also, they're going to be super glad that you brought exactly. it to them. Like exactly. I don't, I've never heard someone's pain. I've been like, Oh, I regret hearing that pain. I'm like, Oh, I'm so glad yeah. that you trusted me with it, that information. Exactly. Cause that's a high level of trust to be yep. open and to be that vulnerable across, you know, any, any, any type of, you know, non EOD, EOD, like family, Yeah. you know, and I think being vulnerable to your family is really hard too. It is. You know? it, it's super hard. I was talking about this the other day and like with, uh, with a guy and with your family, it, it's, it's a weird balance because especially as like, as a male and, you know, a, in this type of field, I feel like it, it's probably similar on the female side. We, in, in this field, people that are EOD techs, male or female, right? Like we tend to be the like dominant personalities in the relationship. And when that happens, you tend to be looked at at the person that's going to solve all the problems, not the person that has the problems. And so 100%. like trying to, I think that's and, where and like, admitting you have problems as that person, as that senior chief master tech that exactly. has all the answers that, that has all the wisdom. Yeah. But Oh, by the way, you know, I'm not happy. Yeah. How do I deal with that? Yeah. Why, I, why am I not happy? I mean, people don't, probably don't even know why they're not happy. Right. But I guarantee you it's because they're not comfortable with who they are, what they're doing, and they don't know their true self. Yeah. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of ways to find your true self. There's, yeah. you know, people are doing, you know, psychedelic experiences, retreats, massive benefit to it. Yeah. There's all kinds of documentaries about that. There's, you know, like I said, just, but I think just finding these communities. And for me, after the Navy, I took my wife, you know, I was just kind of floating through, just getting fat growing a beard. Yeah. Didn't care. You know, I was out and you know, I actually, the way I got, it was more of like a double tap. Yeah. I did, I did, I did relapse and have a second ARI basically. Yeah. And that's what expedited me out. Gotcha. So I did really well in therapy, took a hold of it, but was still in the Navy and still blacklisted and still mm -hmm. even, even more so now to where I was radioactive and nobody wanted anything to do with me. Yeah. So going, being at the training unit as a radioactive person where not only like nothing you've done up to that point matters anymore. You know, none of the work I did up to that point, nobody cared about that. It was just like Carl made this mistake and he's kind of a turd now. Yeah. And that was overwhelming sometimes. So I really dove in on therapy and I spent most of my time in therapy activities with groups, volunteering, you know, the clinics, seeing my psychologist, making sure I'm going to groups, going to morning meetings, doing AA meetings every morning. And, um, you know, kind of becoming more and more of a ghost at the training unit, which made people even more pissed off at me. Yeah. And yeah, it was just like the, when I was finally free from the Navy, then I just kind of floated through and just trying to, you know, we, we had, we had bought a home in Washington and moved up there from San Diego. And, uh, my wife joined, um, it's called Orange Theory Fitness. She was a, and there was a new location at the time. So she got to do the founding member. And then six months into that, she got me, she bought me a, um, a package of classes to go try for yeah. Christmas present. So I went and I tried a couple classes and it was treadmills and rowers and weights that were too light for me, Yeah, <laughs> but not really, <laughs> but uh, it was, uh, it was so much damn fun that yeah. I was like, Oh, you know, I, and I realized how much fun we had every morning at PT in Guam, how much fun yes. we had every morning at PT and even at 11 when it was cold as shit, yeah. it was cold as hell. And we're all in the weight room just joking about how cold it is and who's going to go run first. Yeah. You know, and you got guys that are like packing on luxury, like you need that Northwest package boys. <laughs> Stayed in cold out. And um, in the, those days, you know, you think about those, that was like some of the best times. And, and that's what kind of drove me into the fitness realm. Um, 
six months after, you know, so I, I did my classes. I joined as a member six months into it. They really needed coaches. They had like a, tr a falling out with the manager and some coaches. So they were just severely understaffed. And I was yeah. like, well, I'll try out. And so I did, you know, got a two week group training certificate, you know, group fitness instructor certificate, super easy. Um, got hired. I did an audition, got hired and, and started coaching at this, at the studio that I was a member at. And that's what started coaching for me. Nice. At the same time, I was going to business school. Yeah. So it was a perfect job because I could go coach. I could get up early, coach a few sessions in the early in the morning, go to my classes, still be home in time to eat some lunch and go get my kids from school. That's awesome. So it was a good trade off. That's know? a that's a good like balance. Yeah. Yeah. We get the eight hours done by two p.m. Or you know you're you're doing pretty well. Yeah. You know so it was, you know get all that stuff in, get it done, and um, enjoy the evenings with my young children, which was it was just such a gift. I'm so lucky that I didn't deploy with kids at home. Yeah, I came home my last deployment ever. My first daughter was born, you know, going through the training unit and, and having that separation, you know, some travel, nothing too long, nothing too lengthy, but some travel, but not like six months, like the guys have to go through. And yeah. I couldn't imagine like how hard that would be, you know, mentally on yeah. someone, you know, that separation, especially from the kids. But, um, yeah, working in fitness and, and having, you know, bringing value to other people. That's really where it's at, and that's what you're gonna. Everyone that's in in the service in uniform, you're gonna find a way to bring value to people, and yeah. that's that is your transition. Where is your value? Where does it fit in society? You know, it could be all kinds of ways. Yeah, you know, absolutely. guys are making, you know, cool knives and yeah. selling knives online. Guys are, you know, doing patches and T-shirts and you know all kinds of e-commerce business. Mm -hmm. You know, there's all kinds of um, information service businesses. There's all kinds of you know financial services or financial. Um, you know, like a account management type stuff. There's guys that are really good with those things. There's guys that are good at training and, and you know, having training companies and, and yep. working and still staying in the EOD field as a trainer, which is fantastic. Like, yeah, I would love to go teach IEDs again. I would love to go teach, um, you know, war fighters, you know, what we did. Yeah. Because it's just, there's a tremendous value in, in passing on that knowledge and passing mm -hmm. on, because then, you know, I remember a guy that I, we taught something in IED division. He came back from Afghanistan. He's like, thank you for teaching me that. Yeah. He came back to me and said, thank you for teaching me this. This one thing I did, actually did it and it worked great. That's awesome. And I was like, dude, yeah, totally relieving. Right. There, there's no better feeling than that. Right. Like, the grad, yeah. The, the, the note that, that you did something that helped somebody, mm -hmm. um, in that, in that training sphere, you know, like I said, I kind of, I think I stuck with fitness too. It was just with my DD 214 being all jacked up and have a black eye on it. It's not, it wasn't possible for me to work at the government anymore. It yeah. wasn't possible for you to get. Most corporate jobs, anybody that asked to see my DD-214, it was like the last thing that I'd hear from them. You yeah. know, I'd send it to them like, here it is. I'll explain it. And they're like, don't worry about it. <laughs> and they, they wouldn't say that. They just, they just yeah. don't. Like in civilian world, they just ghost you. Yeah. They don't like call and explain why they don't hire you. They just like, they just don't communicate to you. Yeah. And you ask why. And like, oh, well, someone would communicate if you got the job. Like, okay, thanks. <laughs> That's, it's like when you go to medical and. They're like, we'll call you if something's wrong. You're like, how about you call me either way? Yeah, like, just give me that peace of mind. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, um, it, it, and then COVID shut everything down, obviously. Yeah. So, you know, I was out 2016, uh, finished my degree 2019. Um, I was still coaching and then I took a job in aerospace manufacturing as, you know, really as an apprenticeship. And I was, um, just wiring stuff up again, back to working on electronics and it was more electrical heavy too. So I got to learn a lot of like electrician skills, yeah. high and low voltage, um, as well as, you know, work on, you know, customizing robots that were going to be used in aerospace manufacturing lines. So it was a cool job, not a cool company, <laughs> not, a, not a good leadership team. <laughs> yeah. And so butted heads to the point where they said I didn't fit in with their culture and they let me go. Gotcha. <laughs> and I was just like, well, you guys can't lead a fucking horse to water right now. You guys are useless. Um, we were just doing, as an apprentice, I was leading people. Yeah. You know, as an apprentice, I was organizing labor forces, you know? So I was like, this is, uh, I think I should be getting paid more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I am above the job scope description. <laughs> I know. I'm just going above and beyond because it just had to get done. Yeah. That's what we do. Yeah, it like, is. We fill in gaps. EOD guys will come in and they'll see gaps and they fill them in make sure yep. shit gets done. Yep. And, and you'll see that that's a tremendous value that most people don't have. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're way off. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to spend a bunch of time on this, but you said something that that it's uh, it's got me thinking. It's got me thinking. Um, I started thinking about this probably a, 
honestly about the time the podcast started, but then the more I've like gone in and done some, some mental health stuff on, on my side, the more I've thought about this. Right. And, uh, I brought it up last night, did a, uh, did a panel thing, um, on mental health. And near the end, one of the things I said, is like, and this isn't, this isn't specific, like to you, but you brought it up and it kind of, it, it ties in really well. Right. In, in the last handful of years, when I've been, as I look back and I think about it, there are, there are people that were in the EOD community that started going down a path. Right. And um, end up either getting their crabs pulled, admin separated, you know, like getting out of the Navy. Right. And, and some of them, they, they were going to do it no matter what. But as I look back that the, the thing that makes me disappointed in myself and in leadership, my leadership, leadership at the same level, whatever, is that the, the worst part about that. And, and, this is from an outside looking in is that you can see people that had awesome reputations and then something happens and, and then now their, their reputation in the community is, is like, Oh, that, that dude's a turd, their, their shit bag. Right. And I'm, I've literally thought that. And the thing that is disappointing on me is as I look at that before that, that crab pull, the admin separation, that, that whatever happens, right. Almost every time everybody can say, yeah, man, they were like, doing this, they were doing that, you know? And then as I think back to myself, but also to, to other leaders to the left and right of me, right. Nobody did anything. Everybody just said like, yeah, they got to man up. They got to finish like training that team. They got to do this. They got to do that. Like sometimes it's our job to pull them from that team. Right. Mm, Be like, save them, dude, you, you are done. Like you're, you're mentally done. That's the problem. It's not that you're a total turd. It's not that you don't care. It's that you're mentally exhausted to the point where like, you don't even recognize it. Exactly. You're, you're pushing forward and you're like, for me, I couldn't even pass, um, a Mark, a Mark 16 supervisor board. Yeah. Like I, I failed it twice and I'm like, what the hell is wrong with me? I can't remember this stuff. You know, my, and then that really hurt me yeah. you know, with the mental health aspect. And as well as, you go to the gym and you're injured and your body's breaking down and the stress that we put ourselves through those like routine deployments and all that work. Mm-hmm. And there's not really any deloading in bodybuilding or in physical fitness. You have what you call like a deloading, which means you're just not going to work out. You're going to work on healing yourself with food, right? Eat lots of good food, drink lots of water and rest and stretch like deload. Let yourself, let your body heal. Yeah. There's not a lot of that going on anywhere in the military. Right. We don't allow guys to deload. We don't allow guys to heal. Yeah. And they need to give them the width, and the breath and the time. Mm-hmm. If you're going to spend a year and a half training someone for war and spend them to war for half a year, there should be a substantial amount of time for deloading. Yeah. Yeah. And I, like, you know, I, I say that and I understand that there are, so this is where like at, at a certain level of leadership, there has to be some accountability to like, our job is to protect our people, right? Not just from the IEDs and from, you know, shooters and whatnot right yeah that that's a portion of the normal training but it's to protect them from themselves too right mm-hmm. and more mistakes will happen with your when you're building up those and it's almost like you're you're stacking insecurities on top of each other to the point where you people are you know spazzing out yeah you see temper tantrums you see temper yeah. flare you see decisions being made you see decisions being questioned as they're being made yep that's those are all signs of like we need to this person needs a break yeah and and there, there has to be like a, a reasonable amount of time to, to allow the person to like really focus on like actually making themselves better. Right. Right. And, and you can't say, okay, Hey, go make yourself better here. You're going to go to a short duty where you're going to be working 12 hours a day. Most or, days, or they make it like, or they make it almost like, um, like they're, let's say condescending, like, Oh, go see the head shrink. Yeah. yeah. Oh, why don't you go see the doctors then? Right. Oh, why don't you take some time off? And they make it like in a condescending way instead of like, right. We're planning on you to recover and heal yeah. and become the best version of yourself to come back. And, and because for five years, 10 years, however many it was, you were rock solid. Like here's, here's the reason why you've been rock solid. You've been the person that we've asked to go and yeah. do extra things. And you're not that person for us right now. And we want you to be that person again. We need you to deload. We yeah. need you to like because focus they just, on they yourself. just scrap you. Yeah. yeah, I would say I was. You know, 
you have the go-to guy. Yeah. That's like a, yeah. a term you see on evals. This is my go-to person, yep. you know, um, this is my go-to for, you know, SME, you know, across the community, Yeah, guys and girls, you know, just much respect for everybody that's doing the job, obviously. And it's so unrecognizable when we're going to be like, well, they need a break or, you know, you, you don't want them to honestly at yeah. a point where like, this is a high performer. I don't, I don't want them to take a break because I need them yeah. at their high performing level. But instead of really building everybody up and, and showing that it's a routine to do that, that mm -hmm. break that, to break that cycle for, for mental and, and physical well being, Yeah. Um, and just programming it in there. And that's, like I said, I think the people also that probably need it the most are in leadership positions and they, they're like, well, I never got a break. Why should I give everybody else one? Right. Yeah, I've heard that. I'm, I'm in admin. I'm <laughs> in admin now. That. I'm in leadership now. And I'm, you know, I remember guys, you know, like the CO5 would be there all damn night. Yeah. Or uh, remember the XO and he would do, do you remember you know what I'm talking about? Chai uh, Chai's oh, yeah. Chai Chai name? Uh, I, think he, I think he just retired, but the XO at five when we were there was a scary man <laughs> yeah. who would be smarter than you when he did a spot check on you. Yeah. He didn't, and it could be like, it doesn't matter what maintenance item it is. He would stay up all night studying it yeah. to make sure that he knew how to ask the questions and yeah. he knew what answers to find. He wasn't playing around. No. And whenever he had a spot check with that guy, I was like, I'm giving it to you. Yeah. I'm the, exactly. LPO, I'm the LPO. I'm not doing it. You do it. hundred <laughs> <Yeah>. percent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just so, it's, you know, scary, smart people. But, um, and, and I think those guys too, like the ones that are approving the deloading mm -hmm. need to be doing it themselves. Yeah. Yeah. All the way to the top. I agree. It doesn't matter how many stars you have. I don't care. I a hundred percent agree. Cause it, it, you look at, you know, to use a sweet, sweet analogy, you look at a, like a, a race car, right? Dude, if they sit at red line for an infinite amount of time, eventually the motor it, blows. Yeah. It just blows, but you can Some be at red like, line for a while mm. and then back it down a little bit and then you can go back up and then back it down. And like, mm -hmm. if you do that, you can perform and, you know, if you're going, and we, that's the thing is like, the hard thing is the type of people that join EOD want to be at red line. The problem is we don't understand how much that get, hurts us. We in get the conditioned long run. in the very beginning Yeah, from day one dive school. Yeah. You're in the red. Yep. This is how we operate. This is how we learn. This is how we run things. Yeah. And you know, your, your leave, your pre or post deployment leave is like your only real break. Yeah. And a lot of times guys are, I mean, I knew guys that take leave and then go, um, before my Iraq team, a teammate during his leave time, he designed and built a cage to, to attach to our EOD gerb that would lower the robot. Yeah. And so he had dual winches, but we rigged it all up. He showed us how it worked. And then when we got in country, we had welders attached that they took the spare tire that were the, well, they had removed the spare tires because of fires anyways, Yeah. but where that spare tire was on those joint EOD response vehicles, we had put this robot tray that my yeah. friend worked on tirelessly. You know, yeah, he, just, we, he just, he just went from one red to another. We just can't stop. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So, you know, with, with all that kind of being said, one of the things I, I, I want to kind of point out and we've talked about in, you know, the last few conversations is, uh, you know, obviously like you can end up doing something that puts you down a path that like, that kind of sucks. And by kind, I mean like really sucks, <laughs> but you can make a choice like you did. Right. And at some point get therapy and then pull yourself out of it. And I like that, you know, I don't know if it was intentional or not, but, but you said, um, you know, like basically you did the work and then you pulled yourself out. Right. And, and that's actually really specific. And that's something that, you know, in, in talking with uh therapist too is, is important because if you don't do the work, Nothing nobody's happens. if yeah. you don't want it to if you don't want it to work it's not going to if you yeah. resist therapy it's useless yeah so i like i said i had lost everything to where i don't have any pride to hold on to anymore i don't have this like uniform that i'm trying to sh keep spotless and you know mm -hmm. senior chief crown's not going to go see a psychiatrist he's good you know i'm going to deal with my problems my way yeah and i'm going to keep crushing everything i see in front of me in uniform and i just kept doing that and that was actually to my detriment i remember requesting a medical retirement which was denied yeah because i was such a high performer they said there's no lack there's no there's no evidence that supports that you couldn't do your job for your impairments yeah and it's like well my argument was it's, it's called behavioral health like my behavior had changed yeah my behavior became detrimental to my service but they don't see it that way right unfortunately 
And I even stood in front of the board in DC. I appealed until I got to stand in front of them in DC on my own dime. And they still denied it to my face. Yeah. Because I had such a stellar record. Yeah. It's like awesome. That's it. You know, and then, the, you know, of course, it's it just kind of a wash and a mood point. And I don't, I, you know, obviously nothing but gratefulness for my service. Yeah. You know, for what I was allowed to do and, and for what, you know, I could accomplish and what I could, um, you know, provide to the service and to our country and to our teammates, you know, I'll always be grateful for that time. And of course you just, we all just wish we had more of it. Yeah. We all just yeah. wish we could have a little bit more. And so now, you know, I'm just trying to do the best I can as a business owner, as a father, as a husband and, you know, making lasting impact and, and making sure, you know, people are safe. Cause it's like mm -hmm. having that safe space to be vulnerable is what we all need. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's the, the other piece to, to what was, you know, on the, that you can pull yourself out of it too. Cause like it's, you, you know, know, make yourself the best person possible by, if you dive into it and, yeah. you, and like you said, like the wheel, I remember seeing the feelings wheel and I remember yeah. seeing like, well, that's kind of silly, but yeah, I'm definitely, I can follow it. Yeah. It's easy to use. Mm -hmm. But if you're in a mindset where like, this is dumb, this is yeah. whatever, this isn't going to help. It's not. Yeah. But it, like now that, now that you're out there, it's, there's some struggles, but you found, you kept, you kept pushing mm -hmm. and you found this thing that now you are a business owner and, and, you're, you're making things successful and you've got that, you know, that, that family purpose and that business purpose and like that community purpose, which is awesome. Actually, my, my got, business is building a community. And that's, that's what I was just going to say, which is awesome. Like it's all tied in one, which is, I wish it could great. be free, but I have to pay yeah. the bills. <laughs> yeah. Sorry to all my members who are watching this. I still have to pay rent <laughs> and California taxes, which that's, I won't, <laughs> but I won't raise your dues. I always keep my promises. I won't raise your dues. New people though. Um, yeah, it's uh, building a community that people don't even understand how impactful it is until they're a part of it. Yeah. You know, you get phone calls like, what's the price? Why, why should I show up? And they're like, just just show up. And yeah. you'll understand why you should show up. Yeah. Because you can't sell community. You can't sell the feeling of being connected over the phone. Right. You can't show the emotional connection of making new friends working out with your children. Like I have parents who work out with their teenagers yeah, and now they don't fight at home as much That's because awesome. they actually get some fucking exercise. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're actually feeling better about themselves. They're not feeling like crap. They're not knowing why. Like most people don't use their bodies. If you're sick and you're overweight and you're frustrated and you're just, you're feeling mean spirited, you're kind of salty. You don't, you know, you don't understand, you know, where the goodness is in the world. You need to exercise right yeah. now. And it doesn't, you don't have to do what I do. I mean, we, we do it's pretty intensive. It's not for everybody, but we can, we can make it for anybody if they're willing to take those options, if they're willing to work with a coach and, and ramp it down. Yeah. So it's not competitive, but people show up like, oh, I can't do this. I don't want to do it. It's yeah. not about what you can or can't do. It's about doing what you can. Right. And we have a coach, a professional trainer in the room every time with a group of, you know, usually 20 people or less, you get plenty of attention from them to make sure that you're doing appropriate. And most people just don't know what to do. That's yeah. why they don't exercise. They don't know what to do. Yeah. They don't know what they like. They never tried much. You know, and it's, you see it in sports at schools where it's like, you try out. How many kids try out to actually get on sports? Yeah. You know? And what are those kids doing now? Yeah. What are the kids that don't play sports doing? Because yeah. there's more kids in school not playing sports yep. than there are kids are playing sports. You focus all this time and attention on your kids in sports. That's great. But how about we just teach them how to stay active and use their bodies and find things they enjoy? Yeah. Like riding your freaking bike or paddle boarding or whatever it is you know, going for jogs. Like my kids, now we want it. One's in cross country as a fourth grader. Nice. That's amazing. And it's really cute. It's not like they're doing crazy stuff. Yeah. It's super cute. Mile times. And then, so we want to work, they want to work on their mile times with me now. That's so awesome. So now I have this avenue of providing, you know, knowledge and, and, and just value to my kids' lives through yeah. some kind of physical activity. And I think that's anything any parent can get behind, right? Yeah, absolutely. People pour so much into their children's and, and ignore themselves so much. And that's, mm -hmm. You know, we have a kid's room. We, we want parents to be able to drop off the little ones, get their exercise. You know, we want 12 and up can be in the room with them. We want them to work out with their kids. We want yeah. this to be a family experience. That's kind of like what makes us special is you can do this, mm -hmm. you know, with the coach in the room, making it appropriate. Yeah. And, and yeah, just seeing families kind of flourish and, and finding energy and finding like just like a new passion and, and a fun place and a safe space and, you know, something out of the norm that adds to their day. You know, yeah. I get to be the best part of some people's day as a coach. That's awesome. And that's, that feels good. Yeah. That, 
That is great, man. That's, that's good to hear. That's, that's something that, um, you know, with it, my, it makes the financial investment worth it. Yeah. <laughs> the entrepreneur part, the finance side of business is scary as fuck. Like you sign some papers, like the, I personally guaranteed this million dollar lease. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hope it works. Hope yeah. I can make enough money. You know, it's, it's a scary thing where financially my poor wife's the accountant, you know, she runs our business manager, the accountant. So she's like, we need to cook up. I need you to find some money. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm out there, you know, finding whatever it has to be, you know, line of credit, a new credit yeah. card, a new loan, whatever it needs to do, whatever we need to do, I'll, I'll find it. Right. That's what we do is, you know, as any EOD tech will understand, like you will find a way. Yeah. And in business, like you will find a way, um, because we're not going to, well, or, or we'll die trying. Yeah, you exactly. <laughs> and that's okay too. Cause there are businesses died. Like I've, I've accepted the, 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 the chances of this business dying. Especially you talk to other people that have a lot more business experience. Like, yeah, it's like the fourth or fifth one. You'll finally figure out. I'm like, Oh my God, <laughs> you know, technically I'm on my second. Yeah. <laughs> I tried, I tried a couple of MLMs, multi-level marketing. Okay. And that's where I really found out how bad at sales I was. Yeah. You know, working in an industry, fitness industry as a coach, as a trainer, and then finding out how to work that sales process. Cause it's not just about the experience. The experience has to be magnificent. It has to be mm -hmm. a truly unique experience for someone to want to start putting money in every month on it. Yeah. So that part figured out first, what's the product, what's the experience, where's, where's the community feeling, making sure they feel that connection. Cause then they're going to keep coming back. Right. And that's how you build the community. Yep. Everyone just keeps coming back and the, you know, less people leave, more people come in, bada boom, bada bing. Next thing you know, you actually could pay the bills. Yeah. You know, <laughs> But it does take a lot of work, a lot of sacrifice, you know, going unpaid for, you know, two years. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I expense a lot of things on the business, you know, but we take owner's draws. We don't take pay. Right. Um, it's tough. But, you know, when you see what you see happening in your business is worthwhile, then all the other stuff, you could just deal with it. Yeah. You know, there is a, there is an emotional roller coaster where you're going to feel like you're making it some days and you feel like you're going to die some days. It's up and down and yeah. you have to understand that. And that's where honestly going through the therapy that I went through has helped me tremendously with that roller coaster feeling because the emotion, the emotional intent is very high and very low. Like a lot of times we, we avoid those strong emotions yeah. because it's just too much of a feeling of overwhelmingness, yeah. you know, so that, you know, we would numb it away yep. like I used to. Um, and it, it is dealing with it as far as like, here's a problem. Here's five solutions. I'm going to work on number one tomorrow. If that doesn't work, I'm going to work on number two the day after that. Yeah. If that doesn't work, I'm going to work on number three. If all five don't work, I'm going to keep searching. And it's just that the only people that fail is because they quit. Yeah. I say, I think. Because you could fail. You could still lose a business. It's not a real failure. It's a lesson. Yeah. You might lose all your money. You might have to start over again. You might have to, you know, whatever, chapter 13, chapter 11, bankruptcy, reorganize your debt. But you're not dead. Yeah. Right. You know, right. you're not going to die from going in debt. You might feel like you're dying. Yeah. <laughs> you might want to die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You might want to kill some people too, <laughs> but the, but you know, managing your expectations and doing the work you need to get done and really kind of pulling yourself up. And I found all kinds of ways to pull myself up like days where I'm just like, want to curl into a ball. Yeah. Now I have like a little premonition. I'm like, okay, tomorrow's gonna be really hard. So I have like a trick. I'll, I live in a two story home. I'll put my phone, my alarm downstairs. I built an ice bath. I have an ice bath outside. Yeah. It's like, okay, you're just getting in the ice bath. Even if it's only 10 seconds, Carl, it doesn't matter. You're getting in that, yeah. that motherfucker. Because you get in and again, like that cold rush, I think that's that adrenaline, the oxygen saturation. You know, there's all kinds of cool topics to talk about with cold plunges and um, getting that thing first thing in the morning. And it's like, you're so energized for the day. Yeah. And it's okay, I'm going to go kill this day now. That's awesome. I don't do it every day, but when I have to get up before 4 a.m. to go yeah. open, I'll do it. <laughs> that's, a, that's early. It's so early, dude. <laughs> I open up, my doors are open at 4.30. Nice. And then I don't have to do it all the time though. Thank God. I yeah. have tremendous coaches. I have a manager who's just been a ride or die the whole time. Nice. And she's just been a lifesaver for our business. Um, you know, coaches, we've had coaches come and go that just couldn't really make the grade. And we have coaches now that are just really dedicated, not just to their craft, but to the community. And that's, that's cool. a truly special person that you'll see in fitness. It's like so many people are just in it for their own, I'm in fitness because I'm so in shape I'm not, and I know the most. Yeah. Nobody cares about what you know until they know that you care. Right. Yeah. You know, that's a, that's a, that's a staple across, I think many industries, but you could be the smartest person in the room, but if you don't give a shit about other people, no one's going to listen to you. Yep. Yeah. So why would they? <laughs> yeah. Cause you're yeah. not in it for them. Exactly. You know, that's what, I mean, in a selfish way, people want to know what, what's in it for them. Yeah. And you know, as, 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 as coaches, as business owners that care and will fight everything 
to keep that business going instead of just giving up on the first difficulty and closing our doors. Yeah. You know, there's, I've had plenty of reasons to close my doors. You know, I could have, I could have, uh, phoned it in when my, my SBA, my small business administration loan was denied. I could have phoned it in. Just, I could have called the whole thing right there, but I didn't. Yeah. I put together the funds I needed to put together and I made it go. I made it work. You know, so there's, it doesn't mean that you, you don't really, you don't really fail until you quit and you don't, you don't need to quit. You can, you can take a knee. You could feel like you get punched in the gut, but you take that lesson and you make sure it doesn't happen again. Yeah. I like it. Um, <clears throat> as we kind of close out, what, uh, do you have anything that you'd like to just kind of put out there for, for everybody? Everybody? Um, like anybody listening. Oh, yeah. Just remember to find love, spread love, not hate. <laughs> um, watch your buddies on Liberty. Be a good Liberty buddy. Make sure everyone goes home safe. Uh, don't drink and drive. Obviously. Smart. I just do a weekend brief. We do like a, like a long <laughs> weekend brief. All right, guys. So remember these places are off limits. If I see you there, I'm not going to tell you either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you're gonna drink and drive make sure you're with someone that's gonna help you carry out of the vehicle uh no it's good obviously never do that but yeah. now that uber has been like a lifesaver for yeah. DUIs. i hope i hope the duis and the services have plummeted thanks to uber especially in san diego but i know people yeah. there's another story i won't we won't get into that one but i remember being blamed i was actually blamed for someone's dui because they didn't report it it came through the blotter to the to the commodore yeah the commodore comes down you know through the command at the training unit and it's someone in my division and the next was like, I know you knew about it and you hid it from us. And I'm like, what? I just found out the same time you guys did. <laughs> you were supposed to know everything that every one of your people does. And if they don't, that makes you a bad leader. Exactly. Oops. <laughs> um, yeah. Closing remarks though. I would say, you know, for anyone in the service, focus on finding who you are out of the service. You're translating your skills, your experience to people that have no idea what it, what those mean. Yeah. So there's all kinds of trans transition services. You know, I was fortunate enough to be with the commit foundation. Um, there's the honor foundation. Yep. There's, um, there's other veteran organizations. I, I can't name them all, but there are so many nonprofits and services that are there to help you that just take, take the pride, put that aside and make sure you're asking for help, especially when it comes time to get ready out of the, get out of the uniform. Yeah. Cause that's going to be the most important thing. Like, you know, yourself and your family are going to be there. You have to live with yourself. Hopefully your family stays with you and that's going to outlive your military career, no matter how long it is. Right. Absolutely. You know, I don't care if you're an admiral with 40 years in, eventually that uniform's coming off yep. and you still got to deal with yourself. Right. Yeah. So it's, um, I, I would say that that self discovery, that journey, everyone has to make it, but you have to make the journey. You can't yeah. just put it off forever because eventually, you know, you, you might have that midlife crisis where you do end up, um, you know, in the therapy seat and you'll, you'll be forced to take that journey, but voluntarily going through that stress will make you a better person. Yeah. So definitely yeah. for forever listeners, find yourself, be yourselves, be true to yourself. Yeah. That's the best thing anybody can do. You don't have to be compared to other people. You don't have to be better than other people. You just have to be the best you. And that's going to be enough. Yeah. Every day. That's definitely enough being the best you, whatever that is, you know, I like it. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Appreciate yeah. you. All right. We'll have to do it again, man. All right. All right. Follow up. <laughs> Thanks. Sweet. Oh, is that a long one? Thank you for listening to the Echo Oscar Delta podcast, where we talk to Navy EOD techs and hear the stories that they want to share.